The committee will come to order without objection. The chair is authorized to declare recess of the committee at any time. This subcommittee is holding our third hearing on PFAS contamination, focusing on the need for corporate accountability. I now recognize myself for five minutes to give an opening statement. As I mentioned, this is the third hearing the subcommittee has held on the dangers of perfluorokill and polyfluorokill substances, the man-made toxic chemicals known by their acronym PFAS. It is the second hearing that focuses on the role of industry in the contamination of Americans' drinking water, groundwater, air, and food supplies with these chemicals. If the subcommittee's last two hearings haven't made it abundantly clear, we're dealing with a national emergency here. PFAS chemicals have been linked to serious adverse health, health outcomes in humans, including low fertility, birth defects, suppression of the immune system, thyroid disease, and cancer. The EPA has issued a health advisory on two of the most well-known PFAS chemicals, PFOA and PFOS, and is currently in the process of determining how these chemicals should be regulated. The current Assistant Administrator for the Office of Water at the EPA, David Ross, agreed that PFAS contamination was, quote, a national emergency. Several states have already taken steps to regulate these chemicals on their own. My point is, this is not a small or emerging or ambiguous problem. It is a full-blown crisis that our government has already acknowledged. So our goal here today is to demand accountability for this crisis. Our first witnesses are both attorneys, Lori Swanson, the former Attorney General of Minnesota, who led a massive case against the 3M company on behalf of the state of Minnesota for the company's role in damaging the environment with perfluorokill chemicals, including PFOS and PFOA. After eight years of litigation, 3M settled the case with the state of Minnesota last year for $850 million, which is the largest environmental settlement in the state's history. That money will be used to clean up the sites that have contaminated Minnesotan residents. Our second witness, Robert Billet, did I pronounce that correctly? Balot, excuse me. Robert Balot was one of the first lawyers to successfully sue DuPont on behalf of people who had been exposed to PFAS chemicals and have suffered greatly as a result, losing their livelihoods, their health, and their family members. Bucky Bailey, a witness at this subcommittee's July 24th hearing, was one of the people Mr. Balot defended. In 2017, DuPont and its spinoff company, Kimors, agreed to pay $671 million for polluting the area around a DuPont manufacturing plant in Parkersburg, West Virginia, the same plant where Bucky Bailey's mother was poisoned when she was pregnant with him. Representatives from 3M, DuPont, and Kimors are here with us today, and let me say we are not here to relitigate the cases these companies have already settled or quibble over each company's degree of liability. This subcommittee is not a court, and I am not a judge. This subcommittee is here today because we want more than legal accountability. Though legal account accountability is great, too, we want ethical accountability. I look forward to the first panel of witnesses, which will help us explain to the subcommittee why and how these companies got away with poisoning people for more than a half century. Because make no mistake, that is exactly what happened. The documentation is clear. As early as the 1950s, in-house scientists at 3M and DuPont began discovering that PFAS chemicals were bioaccumulative, meaning they build up in the body, justifying their nickname, forever chemicals, and toxic. And yet, despite these consensus among scientists within both companies, DuPont and 3M continued to deny the toxicity of long-chain PFAS chemicals. I want everyone in the room to really think about what it must be like to live next to a toxic waste dump with your family, your kids that you never knew was a toxic dump. Imagine drinking and breathing toxic chemicals that you never knew were toxic because the companies who made them never told you and suppressed the research that confirmed just how toxic the chemicals were. And as we'll learn from the testimony, these extensive, there's extensive documentation that confirms that this is exactly what these companies did. I'm not editorializing here. And this isn't faux outrage. I'm not being hard on these companies just for show. These are people's lives we're talking about. I hope everyone watching here today will go and read more about this issue, learn more about the extent of what has been happening over the past several decades, 
because what these companies have done is deeply immoral and shameful, and there's no other way to put it. So I hope we don't waste our time today on phony debates over the science. It's almost 70 years since research on the toxicity of these chemicals began. The evidence is clear and convincing. Enough is enough, and after hearing this important testimony today, the subcommittee plans on using the information learned to press these companies to admit that they know these chemicals are toxic and acknowledge their past conduct of concealing important scientific studies regarding PFAS toxicity. We will also urge them to work together with Congress to address this national emergency, which includes designating PFAS as a hazardous su substance under the Superfund. I respect these companies' long and storied histories here in the United States. And I respect the fact that these companies have made products that Americans want to buy and have made Americans' lives easier. But I'm a compassionate capitalist. I don't think for one second that I won't hold these companies accountable when they screw up. And these companies with us here today have screwed up, and we need to hold them accountable for doing so. I hope the people representing those companies here today will admit their mistakes so that we can all move forward and achieve what I believe is our common goal, to clean up contaminated sites, stop exposing innocent people to toxic chemicals, and making sure that all Americans have clean water, clean air. Thank you, and I now invite the ranking member of the subcommittee, James Comer, to give a five-minute opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We're here today for the subcommittee's third hearing this year on the large group of chemicals collectively known as PFAS. I appreciate the willingness of today's witnesses to appear before us. As I've said at each of our hearings, potential drinking water contamination is frightening for any community, and I look forward in particular to hearing from our second panel witnesses, 3M, DuPont, and Comores, about their efforts to mitigate and remediate any contamination and to develop and use alternatives. It's important to remember the reason that PFAS substances became so prevalent in the first place. They provide strength, durability, and resilience in a broad range of applications from nonstick cookware to firefighting foams that save lives. I'd like to submit for the record a letter recently sent to Congress by the Advanced Medical Technology Association expressing, quote, deep concern about provisions being considered in the National Defense Authorization Act that would circumvent normal regulatory processes and treat all 5,000 PFAS compounds as a single class of chemicals without the adequate scientific data to make such a determination. Why does the medical technology industry care about these proposed actions? Because the medical devices made by these companies have, for more than 50 years, been made with fluoropolymers, a PFAS compound. Tens of millions of these devices have been used by patients without demonstrating any adverse health effects. In fact, they've achieved the opposite. They've kept patients alive and healthy. As I've told you before, Mr. Chairman, I'm committed to working with my colleagues on solutions that will contain any existing damage from legacy PFAS substances and reduce the risk of future harm. But I also hope that we as a body make responsible, evidence-based, science-driven decisions. Any legislative or regulatory actions we consider should be based on a solid scientific understanding of the toxicity of specific compounds. I would also like to note some level of discomfort with today's hearing makeup. Our second panel today, made up of private sector companies, agreed weeks ago to appear voluntarily before the committee. Only very late in the game did the majority announce they would be joined today by attorneys involved with multiple ongoing lawsuits with those same companies. One of those trials is actually set to begin in November, less than two months from now. I'm a firm believer in the broad authority of congressional oversight. But I become very concerned when Congress uses its tools in ways that can interfere with or give the appearance of interfering with ongoing litigation. Broad investigative letters to companies seeking documents and information relevant to ongoing cases and last-minute surprise invitations to hearings for attorneys involved in multiple lawsuits against those companies may raise questions for some about the true purpose of these hearings. I hope the subcommittee will commit to doing its best to refrain from interfering or appearing to interfere with ongoing litigation as we move forward. Today, I hope we will spend some time discussing EPA's PFAS Action Plan, which the agency released in February of this year. In it, 
EPA outlined a number of short and long-term actions to minimize risk, increase scientific knowledge about the broad range of PFAS substances, prevent exposure, and clean up existing contamination. The plan also outlines EPA's actions to coordinate with other federal agencies in state, local, and tribal governments to address the issue. I look forward to hearing from our second panel of witnesses what their view of the action plan is and what they think could be done to make it more effective. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for today's hearing, and thank you for the witnesses who appeared before us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now I want to welcome our first panel of witnesses, uh, Robert Billet, Billet, partner, Taft Stettinus, and Hollister LLP, Lori Swanson, former Attorney General, State of Minnesota, and Matthew Harden, Commonwealth Attorney, Green County, Virginia. If the three of you would please stand and raise your right hands, and I will swear you in. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you God. Please be seated. Let the record reflect that the witnesses answered in the affirmative. The microphones can be a bit sensitive, so please make sure you turn them on and with that little button in front of you and uh, that the microphone is close to you. Uh, without objection, your written statement will be made a part of the record. With that, Mr. Balad, you are now recognized to give an oral presentation of your testimony. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Rob Ballot, and I'm a partner with the law firm of Taft, Statinius, and Hollister out of their Cincinnati, Ohio, and Northern Kentucky offices. I've represented injured parties, parties injured by PFAS contamination for more than the last two decades. But I'm not here today speaking on behalf of any client, but I'm here in response to a request from this subcommittee for information about a pending nationwide public health threat posed by PFAS chemical contamination. The public may only now be realizing the scope of this problem, but the companies that manufactured these chemicals have been aware of the risks for decades, but failed to alert the rest of us. I know because I spent the last 20 years of my career in litigation with these companies, pulling out of their own internal files what was already there and was already known about the risks of these chemicals. For example, by the 1960s and 1970s, DuPont had data in its files from animal studies showing toxic effects in multiple species, rats, dogs, rabbits, monkeys, multiple different types of organ systems, the liver, the testes, the adrenals. By the end of the 1970s, DuPont knew that PFAS was building up in the blood of humans and staying there for long periods of time. By the 1980s, DuPont was concerned about liver damage and birth defects among its own PFAS-exposed workers. DuPont even classified PFOA as a confirmed animal carcinogen, possible human carcinogen, by 1988, after a rat study showed that the chemical caused testicular tumors. A second study emerged only a couple of years later, confirming again not only testicular tumors, but this time also pancreatic and liver tumors. During the 1980s and 1990s, the company also monitored and was concerned about increased cancer rates among its own workers. During the 1980s and 1990s, DuPont even found the chemical in the local public drinking water supply as early as 1984, and at levels above its own internal safety guideline, but did not alert local officials or any of the members of the public drinking that water. As this troubling evidence continued to mount over the years, DuPont, rather than stop using this material, actually went forward and constructed its own PFOA manufacturing facility in North Carolina to continue using and releasing even more of the chemical even after 3M announced that it would stop any further manufacture back in 2000. When the community drinking this contaminated water outside of DuPont's plant in West Virginia finally learned of the problem, DuPont publicly denied that there was any evidence of harm denied its own internal science. In response, we actually en ended up sitting down with DuPont and created an independent panel of scientists back in 2004 
whose purpose was to look at all of the existing evidence and conduct new studies of the impacted community members to determine what the real risks of drinking this in the water were. These independent scientists, referred to as the C8 Science Panel, ended up analyzing data from over 69,000 people, conducted over a dozen completely new studies, some of the most comprehensive human health studies done on any chemical ever. They not only looked at that new data from the new studies, they took all of the evidence. They weighed all of the evidence, all of the animal studies, all of the human data, all of the available data, weighed it all to make a conclusion as to whether or not there were scientific links between drinking this in the water and actual human disease. That took seven years, over $30 million, to find out what the answer to that was. By 2012, this independent panel of scientists had concluded, yes, drinking this in the water was linked with six different serious diseases, including two types of cancer, kidney cancer and testicular cancer. The same type of cancer, by the way, that was found in the rat studies decades earlier. This is independent scientists who weighed all of the evidence. That independent scientific review has occurred Independent scientists have looked at this data, all of the data, and confirmed links with human disease. Unfortunately, despite all of this data that now exists, after years of litigation to pull this information out and to make it public after gag orders, protective orders, etc., now that this information is finally there, unfortunately, EPA still has not acted. I first warned EPA 18 years ago, and we are still here. We have more than enough evidence. It's time to move forward and act to protect the American public. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Balot. Ms. Swanson, you are now recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member, members of the committee. I appreciate the opportunity and invitation to be here today. In 2010, I was serving as Attorney General of my state of Minnesota and filed a lawsuit against 3M Company for damaging, damaging my state's natural resources through its manufacture and disposal of PFAS. Our lawsuit alleged that 3M contaminated the aquifers that supplied drinking water to over 100,000 Minnesota residents. The lawsuit settled last year on the morning the trial was to begin. The settlement required 3M to pay $850 million to the state of Minnesota to bring long-term clean drinking water solutions to my state and another $40 million in short-term solutions. I have been told that it's the third largest natural resource damage recovery in the nation's history. The lawsuit lasted over seven years and involved the production of 27 million pages of documents, about 200 witness depositions, testimony of world-renowned scientists, and over 1,500 court filings. Public records and public trial exhibits in that lawsuit show that 3M knew, but concealed, information about the dangers of these chemicals for decades, some of which the public is just now discovering. In many ways, Minnesota, my state, is ground zero for the PFAS contamination that confronts the country. After the war, World War II, 3M bought the patent to develop PFAS and then started to manufacture these chemicals and ship them around uh, the entire country. Unfortunately, 3M knew about the risks of the chemicals to the drinking water, the environment, and human health for decades, but concealed its knowledge, subverted the science, and kept pushing the chemicals out the door. In 2000, when it stopped making some forms of PFAS, 3M was making about one half a billion dollars a year from the products that were discontinued. And what did 3M know about PFAS prior to the year 2000? I refer you to Exhibit A of my testimony. It shows that in 1997, 3M gave DuPont a material safety data sheet with a label that said, cancer, warning, contains a chemical which can cause cancer, citing 1983 and 93 studies it conducted with DuPont. But 3M removed that label the same year and for decades sold PFAS without warning the public of its dangers. We know that 3M told employees not to write things down, about PFAS and to mark documents attorney-client privilege, regardless of whether attorneys were even involved. We know that in 1988-98, a committee of 3M scientists recommended the company notify the EPA the chemicals were widely found in human blood, but a 3M executive overruled them. Then in 1999, a 3M scientist blew the whistle on 3M. He resigned and sent his resignation letter to the EPA, and he said that, for three, that 3M ecotoxicologists urged the company for two decades to perform an ecological risk assessment 
of PFAS, but the company dragged its feet, and that the company misleadingly downplayed to regulators the presence of these chemicals through the food chain transference. An issue in our lawsuit was what did 3M know and when did it know it? We know that throughout the 1950s, 3M's own animal studies found uh, PFAS to be toxic. By the 60s, it knew the, the chemicals don't degrade in the environment. In 1970, a company that purchased 3M's firefighting, fo firefighting foam had to abandon a test of the product because all the fish died. And then in 1975, two independent scientists, Dr. Warren Guy and Dr. Donald Tavies, found floral chemicals in blood banks throughout the country, and they called 3M to say, we think your chemical is causing this. And 3M pled ignorance, in its words, claiming that Scotchgard didn't contain these chemicals and concealing from the scientists who wanted a chemical footprint that information. In doing so, the company thwarted the broader scientific community's understanding of the health impacts of these chemicals for a generation. We know that 3M soon replicated the studies and confirmed that PFAS was found in human blood. In 1979, 3M's lawyers advised the company to conceal that, conceal that PFOS was in human blood. We know that 3M concealed from the EPA for more than 20 years that PFAS was in human blood. By 1976, 3M knew the chemicals were in the blood of workers at much higher levels, but didn't uh, make this public. By 1978, 3M knew the chemicals killed monkeys. We know that in 1981, the company knew that the chemicals caused, caused abnormalities in pregnant rats. And by 88, a company that purchased PFAS firefighting foam complained to 3M that it falsely claimed the product was biodegradable when it wasn't. A few months later, a 3M employee wrote an internal memo that 3M should stop perpetrating the myth that these floral chemical sur surfacants are biodegradable, but the company continued to sell them. Testimony in our lawsuit showed that by 93, 3M knew that there was some evidence that lactating goats transferred PFAS to their kids in milk and that it was likely that human mothers would do the same thing. But it wasn't until 23 years later that EPA issued a health advisory cautioning pregnant women and breastfed infants to avoid these chemicals out of concern that just like with goats, a mother can transfer the chemicals to her fetus or baby through the placenta or breast milk. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members, I appreciate the opportunity to be here today and talk about these issues and look forward to Congress being part of the solution. Thank you very much. Uh, the next witness, Mr. Hardin, who was just added to the witness list yesterday, and I just received your opening statement an hour ago. Please proceed with five minutes of t opening testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member. Thank you as well to the members of the committee for inviting me to testify today. My name is Matthew Hardin, and although I testify in my individual capacity, I currently serve as the Chief Prosecutor, which is called the Commonwealth's Attorney in Greene County, Virginia. I was previously a litigator from 2014 to 2017, and I used federal and state freedom of information laws to obtain government documents nationwide. I'm here today because many of the public records that I and my colleagues obtained detailed a campaign by plaintiff's attorneys and activists to recruit, quote, a single sympathetic state attorney general, or even grand juries convened by a district attorney, unquote, to subpoena records of private parties targeted by the tort bar. This campaign was in fact successful, as headlines well document, and was followed by a coordinated effort by political donors, again with the assistance of activists, to enlist state law enforcement apparatuses to investigate private parties and otherwise support a private agenda. A report released by the Competitive Enterprise Institute and authored by Christopher Horner, entitled Law Enforcement for Rent, details many of the documents I helped uncover. The lead plaintiff's attorney behind the effort to recruit attorneys general admitted the campaign's political nature in addition to its pursuit of financial settlements in an interview with The Nation magazine. Among other things, he said, legislation is going nowhere, so litigation could potentially play an important role. Also apparently recognizing the problematic nature of these collaborations, the same plaintiff's attorney worked with attorneys general offices against which I litigated, Vermont State and New York State, to mislead a reporter from the Wall Street Journal who called, apparently to inquire about a separate issue entirely. One federal court noted this behavior, asking, does this reluctance to be open about collaborating with plaintiff's attorneys and activists with a, litiga with a litigation agenda suggest that the attorneys general are trying to hide something from the public? My experience and the experience of others forced to litigate numerous open records requests to determine how public offices came to be used in this way suggests the answer is yes. 
One public record I obtained in litigation in the Vermont courts was an agenda for a meeting among activists, prospective funders, attorneys general offices, and plaintiff's lawyers titled, Potential State Causes of Action Against Major Carbon Producers. One academic hosting the meeting described it to attorneys general offices as a, quote, private event for staff from state attorney general offices, unquote, to pursue this agenda. One academic invited to address the gathering boasted in an email to a major donor to her institution and the host institution that this meeting was, quote, about going after climate denialism along with a bunch of state and local prosecutors nationwide, unquote. It is difficult to imagine this being anything other than a national scandal and the subject of numerous Pulitzer Prize winning news stories if the players and agenda were different, which may be why so many media and constitutional watchdogs have chosen instead to avert their gaze. As such, this sort of behavior is becoming normalized and expanding to the point that congressional committees are apparently joining in. Please note that if it is acceptable involving parties and issues you favor, it is also acceptable involving parties and issues you do not favor. If the growing use of public office to assist private litigants is permitted to stand here, what is the limiting principle dictating that the National Rifle Association, pro-life groups, or chemical and fossil fuel companies cannot also chair such use of law enforcement and otherwise use public office to support their ends? I come to this committee both as a prosecutor and to offer my experience on these matters as a civil litigator. I believe in the rule of law and that all citizens are entitled to participate in democracy and have their day in court if they so choose. But I also appear today concerned that private donors and activist groups are seeking to thwart the fair and neutral workings of our democratic policy making and our litigation system, including our law enforcement apparatuses and court system. Civil and critical criminal litigants are entitled to discovery under the rules of court that apply in their cases. The American system of justice is the envy of the world, and our courts are more than capable of applying those rules equitably. But what I saw happening as a private litigator was a perversion of justice. Rather than filing suits and seeking their day in court like any other litigant, powerful special interests sought to enlist law enforcement to obtain public records, seemingly to assist their tort litigation campaigns, as well as to make policy through the use of law enforcement office. When tort lawyers teamed up with attorneys general using either common interest or secondment agreements, the public showed an interest in what its government was up to, and many citizens and interested groups filed freedom of information or state-level equivalent requests. But those requests were frustrated over and over again as states attempted to hide these records. The public has a potential interest, or a substantial interest, in learning how private law firms are recruiting elected officials to further private goals and what, if any, discussions these private attorneys have with the government. I'm calling on this committee to let the justice system work the way it was intended to. Let's try civil cases in civil court, get prosecutors back in the business of prosecuting crime, and get Congress and this committee back focusing on its Article I responsibilities. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, witnesses, for your opening statements. At this time, the chair recognizes Representative Tlaib for uh, questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I really do appreciate, Mr. Bellot, that you're here at the subcommittee, and we really thank you for your important work that you've done to hold DuPont accountable for its decade of wrongdoing. Uh, I know from some of my own struggles to hold corporate polluters accountable in my own district that these are long, hard battles, and I appreciate the commitment you have made to our public health. Michigan has the most PFAS sites in the country at least 192 as of May of 2019, out of at least 610 known sites across the country. Last year, when the state tested public water systems serving nearly 80% of our residents, 10% of those systems sh showed PFAS, and that PFAS in the water in our homes, in our schools, in our workplaces showed up. In Melvindale, in my district, PFAS just oozed out of the ground into the roadway and residents are still searching for answers about where it came from. As construction began on the new international crossing, the Gordy Howe International Bridge, PFAS was found in the soil at the bridge site in Delray neighborhood in Southwest Detroit, right next to the Detroit River, where drinking water is drawn from. This is a man-made crisis, and people like my residents back in the 13th district are the ones who suffer from it. I want to take some time here today and walk through some of the key documents that prove that DuPont knew of the dangers of PFAS chemicals for decades and concealed this truth from Michiganders and all Americans, putting their greed over the public welfare. First, Mr. Chairman, I would like to enter into the record a 1961 correspondence from Dorothy Hood, 
who had served as chief toxologist for DuPont. In this correspondent, Mr. Uh, Ms. Hood states that PFAS should be handled, quote, with extreme care and stated that animal studies conducted by DuPont found liver enlargement. You have been engaged in extensive litigation against DuPont and have reviewed thousands, if not millions, of documents by the company. Based on your review of these documents, approximately when did DuPont become aware of the PFAS was toxic? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your question and thank you for the comments. And, and first of all, you, know, you, you mentioned the fact that there has been such a widespread presence of PFAS detected in Michigan. Uh, that's because Michigan is one of the first states to comprehens comprehensively look for it and test. And unfortunately, I think what we're about to see is the same thing across the country as more places test. Now, with respect to the, the, the information you mentioned uh, from the DuPont files, um, you know, it took many years to pull that information out of the DuPont documents. But what became very clear is that the company was well aware by the early 1960s, as reflected in that document you just referred to from 61, that the, the chemical PFOA in particular was toxic and had various adverse effects. There were numerous laboratory studies going on within the DuPont Haskell Laboratory throughout the 60s and the 70s. And what we tried to do, because there's so much information and so many documents from DuPont's own files. Um, I submitted in with, with my written testimony uh, several court orders, actually, from a federal court in Ohio where a lot of that evidence actually was presented to juries who reviewed all of that evidence, spent weeks going through all of this information, tons of documents from within the DuPont files. And those court orders, the reason I submitted them is because they give you a nice snapshot and summary of some of that key information, some of the key documents organized in chronological order that were reviewed by the court. And in fact, when those documents were presented to juries in federal court, mm -hmm. uh, those juries found that DuPont acted with conscious disregard of the risks that were reflected in those documents. So any of those include um, documents, studies that they were aware of that PFAS was a health risk? Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes. There are, there are plenty of documents within the files. Again, you're talking about documents that first started off with animal toxicity testing. Mm -hmm. And we know we do the animal toxicity testing. On top testing. of your head, what are some of the things that they found in those studies? Just, I know you submitted it for document. I, and Mr. Chair, if I may, I'm going to submit um, uh, a, a study that showed in 1992 that showed DuPont observed an increase in cancer rates among DuPont employees at that time. But in the process, I really want the public and for us to be you know, very, very direct about what exactly was found in the studies specifically that was causing the cancer. Uh, there were, the animal studies showed that PFOA actually caused cancer, liver tumors, pancreatic tumors, mm -hmm. testicular tumors. DuPont had a corporate epidemiology department that actually tracked the incidence of cancer within the workers that were working at the plant handling PFOA. And repeatedly, the corporate epidemiology department found increases in cancers, including kidney cancers. So there were, there were animal study data that supported the risk to human health, and that's why the animal studies are done, to predict human health. And there was actual human data from the worker studies as well. What was missing at that point in time was what it was doing in the community, That's which good. the science panel then filled in. So we have animal, worker, and community data. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. The chair now recognizes Representative Comer for five minutes of questioning. Thank you. Uh, and I'm very interested in this issue, like everyone on the panel, and I'm very passionate about having clean drinking water, and I think that you know, the, the role should be to figure out how can we ensure that uh, every American is protected from this and that we have clean drinking water. And I think the next panel will, will do, will, will, will be a more productive discussion than, than the first, but we have some attorneys, and Mr. Harden, I wanted to uh, focus on on litigation issues and the and the uh, the legal process, because I I tend to believe that sometimes the the trial attorneys make things last longer, make things take longer. You know, we we've got a problem here; it needs to be fixed. And I I, I worry that that sometimes the the ongoing litigation 
tends to uh, delay the process. But Mr. Hardin, you've seen a we've seen a trend in state attorneys general contracting with outside law firms to conduct environmental litigations on the state's behalf against corporations. Correct. On what basis are these outside law firms paid typically? On a contingency fee basis or, or how? We have seen a rise in contingency fee agreements nationwide, and I think that that's part of the problem, is I think that it incentivizes uh, private gain and it takes these offices away from, from litigating truly in the public's interest and towards litigating in a pecuniary interest. I'm curious, in your experience, have state attorneys general been forthcoming and transparent about the relationship with outside law firms in these matters? I would say that it's significantly less than transparent. I think that uh, when people file open records requests, they're consistently frustrated, and uh, we've learned a little bit, but I'm sure there's, there's more to come out. Mr. Hardin, you spoke on your work as a litigator using the Freedom of Information Act to obtain government documents as it pertained to a campaign by plaintiff's attorneys to recruit, quote, sympathetic attorneys general. Uh, and you spoke about, in your opening testimony, the findings in that report. There are many ongoing civil suits and many more likely to come. Do you see similarities between what you found with state attorneys general partnering with plaintiff's attorneys and Congress potentially involving itself in ongoing litigation? Yes, and I think that this, it was already bad enough when, when law enforcement was teaming up with private attorneys because you're, you're sort of blending private and public power. And now when Congress is putting its thumb on the scale, uh, through the oversight process, I think that that just further thwarts the normal working of the judiciary. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Ballot, you, you led the class action lawsuit against DuPont in the early 2000s, which ultimately settled in 2004. Is that correct? That's correct. It's been reported that you and your firm earned $21.7 million from that settlement. Is that correct? You know, we're talking about litigation that actually started in 1999 mm -hmm. and stretched over 20 years. Um, you know, we're talking about litigation that our firm financed and had to actually, you know, push forward for 20 years on its own. Um, and does the firm actually end up getting paid at some point? Yeah, the law firm ended up getting paid. But the only way we know about what we know right now about PFAS was from that litigation, from the community members coming forward and actually pursuing claims and digging this information out of the companies. We would not know any of this today if it hadn't been for that litigation and the 20 years that it took to pull this information out of those companies' files. The companies took steps to prevent the disclosure of that information. DuPont sat, tried to get a gag order to prevent me from even speaking to the EPA about the health risks of these chemicals. Back in 2001, 3M got a blanket protective order in litigation in Minnesota to prevent any public disclosure of its internal documents. That kept Let's, those documents right. secret okay, for almost you, another decade. Okay, you made your point. Have you earned attorney's fees in connection with any subsequent PFAS-related lawsuits? Our, I, I am a partner with a law firm. Our right. law firm uh, receives- I'm familiar with the law firm. Uh, our law firm receives compensation. Right. So can you give us a ballpark figure on those fees out of curiosity? Yeah, you know, I can't. More I, than I don't. a million, less than a million. I'm just, I'm just trying to- learn more about? I believe all of the fee awards were awarded by a court. The mm -hmm. court determines what fees are appropriate for the attorneys based on the number of years of litigation. But, last question, my time's right. Just, do you have a book coming out in a few weeks about your life in the PFAS litigation? Yes, there is a book. And in fact, you know, people are, have been asking me, how did this happen? How is it that all of this information could be known about these chemicals? All of this information could be, could be known. This contamination can occur and, and, and on a nationwide scale. Just last scale. thing, and I have to yield back. You, so you'll receive royalties on that book, correct? I guess that would depend on whether or not uh, the, the book sells. Right. But I'm okay. not here to talk about a book. I'm here to right. talk about what these companies okay. knew about this information. What, I'm not here to talk about me. I'd like to talk about what we learned right. from these companies and why there's now a public health threat. Thank you. Uh, chair recognizes Representative Spear. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, we have a President of the United States who's um, had ghostwritten many books on his behalf. I don't hear us asking him how much he's getting in royalties from that. 
Uh, I'm astonished by the questioning that you were just um, presented with. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, we have companies here who deliberately chose not to reveal very, very um, ne negative information about PFAS that they were selling and chose to hide it from the American people. And they did so and probably were gaining bonuses every year. Are we asking them, did they receive a bonus from hiding this from the American people? That's astonishing questioning that we just heard. And I apologize, Mr. Balot, for the fact that um, you had to go through that. But that's the way we are these days. Let's, let's look at not the reality, the fact that corporations continue to do this, like the tobacco industry continued to do that, um, hide it from the American people, and do so with the understanding that this is a cost of doing business. And if somewhere down the road, some 20 years later, we get caught, we'll pay out a few hundred million dollars, but that won't affect our stock. It's a cost of doing business. It's shameful. Um, I understand you investigated a 2001 study sponsored by 3M. In a letter to the US Food and Drug Administration, you characterized the study as confirming elevated levels of PFAS in the US food supply. Is that correct? Uh, yes. In fact, 3M had completed a study looking at the, the presence of PFAS in a variety of different food, milk, vegetables, bread, in different cities across the country, and found PFAS in milk, bread, etc. in 2001. So and Mr. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to enter Mr. Bilat's letter as well as the 2001 3M study into the record. Without objection, so moved. So, Mr. Ballot, most people have been focused on the contamination in water. But in your letter, you reference levels of PFAS contamination in apples in Alabama, ground beef in Florida, and milk in Georgia, just to name a few examples. There are about 800 parts per trillion. Based on these numbers, it seems like PFAS contamination extends into our food supply. Is there a red flag that should be going up? in every household in America that we are purchasing food products that contain PFAS that are going to have a deleterious effect on our families? I have been trying to get the attention of the federal agencies for over 18 years to look at this and to look at what's already known about what is out there, what, where the PFAS is being found, not only in water but in food as well. And we now know wastewater treatment systems, for example, are, are taking waste in the water, consolidating this stuff, and they're ending up with very high levels of PFAS in bio sludge that's given to farmers across the country where this sludge is spread on agricultural fields, which could be major sources of PFAS for intake by the crops and by the, by the animals. This is something that I've been trying to get our federal agencies to pay attention to for quite some time now, and that's why I'm, I'm very happy to be able to be here. It's, I've, I've, I've had this situation before. I'm familiar with it with, if you can't address the facts, try to attack the messenger. So I've, I'm used to that. That's been going on for 20 years. But that's not going to stop me from trying to at least elevate folks' attention to what we know about this health threat and what we ought to be doing about it, because this information goes back decades. Ms. Watson, uh, you've shown extraordinary leadership. Thank you. Um, on behalf of the American people. I know you were representing your state in Minnesota. Do you think anything would have happened if you hadn't sued 3M? No, I, I don't. Um, I, I think that um, your lawsuit brought to the public's attention a number of the documents we're talking about today. But for decades, 3M concealed information about uh, the risks of these chemicals to the environment as well as to public health. Um, ultimately, this was a major issue facing Minnesota, as it is a major issue facing the entire country. And it did take our litigation to get a significant recovery for the people of our state. And then through that, uh, information about these documents. You know, 3M began after it stopped making some forms of PFAS a campaign to create what they called defensive barriers to litigation and to command the science 
They selectively funded outside research, and they got to the right to review and edit scientific papers about PFAS before they were published. And it even went so far to develop a relationship with a professor and editor of one half of the academic journals in this country about PFAS, where they paid him what we believe is at least $2 million. And in exchange, he was able to send these studies to 3M before they were even published so they could get an advanced peek at them. He made sure in his timesheets that there was no paper trail to 3M. And he even went so far as to advise 3M to keep bad papers out of the literature. Otherwise, in litigation, they can become a large obstacle to refute. And so the company, unfortunately, engaged in a, a campaign to hide its own studies and to, in fact, shape the science through the, the, the funding of these other studies. Now, that's shocking. Who is that uh, journal The editor? professor's name is Dr. John Giese, and he was a professor out of, professor out of Michigan. Uh, my time has expired, but if you could provide the committee, and me in particular, any suggestions that you think we should contemplate in Congress to address that particular issue in general and accountability by corporations as well. Thank you. Thank I yield back. I'd be happy to. Uh, the chair now recognizes Representative Gibbs for five minutes of yeah. questioning. Thank, thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, I think if uh, any companies out there uh, hid things and didn't reveal things to the public and stuff, that should be sorted out in the courts, which I think has happened. Let the judicial system do that. We shouldn't relitigate. That's, I don't think that's our role. That should be sorted out in the courts. And what our role should be determining uh, moving forward uh, what research needs to be done so we make sure we protect the public and, and get the facts straight. And I guess I want to be clear. I, I see that uh, last month the Advanced Medical Technology Association wrote a letter to the Senate expressing deep concern about provisions in the NDA Act that would circumvent uh, the normal regulatory process that would treat all 5,000 PFOS compounds as single class of chemicals. Uh, and their concern is not with adequate data to make that such a determination. Now, I would go on to say I believe. Um, some of these uh, PFOS, like floral polymers, uh, have been used for like 50 years. It has some good um, medical benefits and, and hasn't demonstrated adverse health effects. Um, and some, so I, I guess my first question to uh, the first two witnesses over here is, uh, it, I'm trying to understand this a little better. Uh, there's 5,000 compounds that make up the, this category. Um, is it dangerous to categorize them all as one and go after them, or you know, should we, is there, has there been enough research, scientific data, to show what compounds might be hazardous and what might not be, or, or do you think the whole class of compounds should be? I, I think what we what we do know is that it took this long to find out what the companies already knew about one of these chemicals, PFOA. Okay. It took many, many years to, to dig out what was already known about that chemical. And what we now know about PFOA is enough to know that is something that we really need to take action on. And the scientific community, looking at what we know about PFOA and looking at the chemical similarity of, of these other chemicals in the class, that has raised enough red flags to say we need to be looking at this entire class of chemicals because we don't know what else, what other information is already out there that we don't know about. Uh, we were told for years that PFOA was perfectly fine. There are no health effects. There's no evidence now, of any harm. That was harm. a chemical company telling you? That wasn't FDA or EPA? What, 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 what scientific research was there? Was there well, that's what I'm, when, when we first learned that PFOA even existed and that people were being exposed to it, 1999, 2000 time frame, the companies were telling us, don't worry about it, there's no health effects, there's no evidence that it hurts anybody. It took years of litigation to find out that was not true. So where, was, that, the, where was the role of the regulators during that time? We were, I was doing my best during that period of time to funnel as much of the internal information, non-confidential, from within the company files about the health effects of these chemicals to the regulatory agencies so they could take action. That's been going on for 18 years. Those agencies have more than enough information about PFOA, about the related chemistry to act. Okay, I want to move on, Ms. Swanson. Uh, you set a lawsuit with 3M $850 million, um, 
I guess how much do you know what the, the uh, contingency fee was for the attorneys? Do you know? Mr. Chairman, member, I think it came to about 12.9% of the total settlement. 125 million? I think that's right. Okay. Um, it's at least about 720 million left. Ended up with 739 million because you got interest because interest rates were higher back then. Correct. Um, but apparently um, the money's still sitting there. Uh, Minnesota hasn't uh, used the money to um, do medical care, water testing, uh, any remediation or anything. Or, is that true? The money's still sitting there? Mr. Chairman, Representative Gibbs, the, um, there was a working group formed under the settlement, and the working group, which includes 3M and community leaders, local uh, governments, are evaluating the best way to uh, appropriate the monies. Essentially, the purpose of the settlement and the limitation of the this settlement, settlement was, This settlement was in 2010, right? No, what? 2018, just last year. Okay, I'm mistaken. And, and essentially, um, I didn't have authority to get medical injury damages or injury recoveries for injured people. So the settlement was for damages to the state's natural resources. Under the settlement, the money is going to go to bring clean drinking water solutions to these hundred and some thousand Minnesotans who have contaminated aquifers and contaminated private wells. And the working group, uh, comprised of local units of government and 3M and the state of Minnesota, are trying to figure out the best ways to appropriate that money uh, in order to bring these solutions. If there's money left after the drinking water is dealt with, then it will go to clean up the natural resources and to deal with remediation of you know, fishing habitats and wildlife and things of that nature. Okay. Uh, my time's up, Mr. Chairman. I just want to reiterate, reiterate that we shouldn't make sure we're not uh, lit, uh, relitigating these cases and working for, for how we should be doing more research and, and find more answers to solutions to protect our, our drinking water and our food supply. I yield back. Great. Thank you. The chair now recognizes Representative Dingell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I really thank you for your leadership on this issue. This hearing is really in, important for so many ways because we're trying to get to the truth. And we've got too many communities that uh, are being impacted by this. We don't know how to clean it up. We don't know what the long-term effects are. In order to properly address PFAS contamination uh, in America, we've got to understand the full scientific history behind the health risks and its uses. What did corporations know and when did they know it? And where is this contamination and how are we going to clean it up? Michigan has more sites than any state in the country right now. But that's because we're testing for it. We have more than 70 sites. And as other states begin to test, uh, we're going to see more of these. It is in the water that some people are drinking, though our state is testing water to clean it up. It's in the fish we eat and communities that rely on it, are now being told the fish aren't going to be safe for 5, 10, 15 years. F foam's washing up, and if you're in my district, you're lucky enough now that the fire foam that we're going to, that people are convincing people not to use, has to be destroyed or stored someplace, and people in my district may be getting that as well. So it's impacting Republican and Democratic districts. It's not a partisan issue. Uh, I would like to direct my first questions to um, Attorney General Swanson. When uh, did 3M scientists first learn that PFAS could enter our bodies through food? Mr. Chairman, Representative Dingell, I don't have the answer on food, but I can tell you they first learned that it was hum in human blood in 1975. There were two doctors who came forward, independent scientists, and they were testing blood in blood banks as far away as New York and Tex uh, Texas, and they came forward and they said, these chemicals are in the blood, and we think it's your chemical in the blood. 3M uh, pled ignorance, uh, said, you know, we're not going to admit that. And then the scientist said, could you give us a chemical fingerprint of these chemicals so that we can do more testing to show that it's your product, a chemical in Scotchgard, causing this? And 3M said flat out, no, we're not going to cooperate and provide you that information. 3M confirmed that the very next year that it was in human blood, but it took 20 years for them to tell the EPA and the public. In fact, a 3M in 2006 was fined $1.5 million by the EPA for failing to provide studies that were required to be filed under TSCA, and um, in many cases for decades failed to provide studies. So I'm gonna ask you some questions quickly because we're down to sure. two minutes and there's some important ones. Is it better for the healthy American people and our environment to address the PFAS crisis through continuing litigation, or do we need to get some legislation to address this? 
Mr. Chairman, Representative Dingell, I think it's going to be both, I, but I think uh, it's very, very important that Congress act to help bring global solutions to this problem. How would designating PFAS as a hazardous substance under the Superfund program hold responsible parties accountable for the PFAS contamination that they've caused? Mr. Chairman, Representative Dingell, it would be very helpful to call it a hazardous substance under CERCLA because it will bring, bring to bear known processes for cleaning up these chemicals in communities. It would also help deal with the cleanup around military institutions and bases where the military hasn't really been very quick to clean it up and soldiers are drinking this water and their families. So it would be very helpful for Congress to do that. So do you think it's, we currently have an amendment on the DOD bill that would require that? Because as you know, EPA has yet to even set a rulemaking to set the standard. It's only a guideline. So would designation of that increase or speed up the beginning to clean this up and people recognizing how important it is to deal with this pollutant? Mr. Chairman, Representative Dingell, yes, it would very much expedite the process for that to happen. What specific uh, actions have you taken as AG to hold PFAS polluters accountable, and how can other states and the federal government follow what you've learned? Mr. Chairman, Representative Dingell, it was the company's products that created this problem. It wasn't communities that created it. It wasn't individual homeowners who created it. It wasn't patients who created it. It was the companies that developed widely popular products and sold them. And then when they learned that the products were dangerous to public health and the environment, didn't disclose it. They didn't come clean. And so I think it's very important for the companies that contributed to the problem to be part of the solution and help fund uh, the cleanups. What we did in Minnesota was filed a lawsuit against 3M that recovered uh, $890 million to help uh, bring clean water to uh, solutions to our state. I think other communities across the country are going to have to look at similar actions because this is a very large and significant problem. Thank you. And I'd like to ask one yes or no. Is that amount of money going to cover cleaning up all the sites that you have there? Uh, Mr. Chairman, Representative Dingell, uh, yes. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Without objection, the representatives from Michigan, Texas, and Maryland are authorized to participate in today's hearing. And we have been called to vote. So what we're going to do is I am going to ask uh, Congressman Sarbanes behind me to take over the chair so that he can ask questions while we all go vote. And then he's going to sprint over there and do the same. And uh, after he finishes his questioning, we will move into recess with the next panel. So I thank the three of you, but please stay there. Thank you. I'm going to yield myself um, five minutes to ask questions to the panel. I appreciate your being here. Uh, Mr. Bellotta, I wanted to um, address most of my questions to you. You, at this point, I, I would say, have made a study of the culture in these corporations in terms of hiding the ball over a period of decades. And I'd like you to speak a little bit to that because um, I've seen in the record that you've already created with the testimony that's been submitted um, plenty of instances in which employees inside these companies were trying to raise the alarm, call attention to the risks that were being um, discovered as a result of testing uh, and other evidence that was coming forward. And essentially they were run over by supervisors, by executives, by lawyers, whatever, which seemed to reflect a culture that had taken hold that was making uh, decision makers within these corporations um, disregard or essentially deaf to these claims and concerns, which would have the effect of being demoralizing um, on that part of the workforce inside these companies. Can you speak a little bit to what your investigations um, and, and the litigation that you engaged in uncovered about a culture um, and the extent to which you think that culture in some ways continues, now aided by an army of consultants and lobbyists um, and others that are acting on behalf of these companies. Thank you. Um, you know, it, it took a while to piece this together uh, through a lot of years of combing through internal DuPont documents, and I'll speak to DuPont at this point. Um, but what we saw in the documents is you've got some of the world's best scientists at DuPont and within the Haskell laboratories. And they were doing world-class science. They were identifying serious 
health risks uh, from exposure to these chemicals. And you had scientists warning the company that something needed to be done. Steps needed to be taken. Let's look for alternatives. Uh, maybe the community should be warned. You had lawyers within the company. We had the rare circumstance of being able to see some of the internal documents from lawyers warning the company, warning the business um, you know, that we ought to look into possibly getting people clean water who were drinking this. Uh, so what you see is you had scientists within the company itself who were trying to do the right thing. You had lawyers who were trying to advise the company to do the right thing. Yet, unfortunately, we have, there's a memo from 1984 that I believe is in the record. It's, in, it's referenced in our attachments, where internally the company looks at all of these different factors. And one of the concerns is this could penalize our business going forward. The sales for these materials are increasing. And uh, you know, one of the problems we're dealing with was it was not regulated at that time. So the decision was made to keep on using the material. Not only keep on using it, but increase the use and increase the emissions out into the environment, despite what the internal scientists and lawyers were warning. And part of that, that you talk about a culture, you're talking about a situation where you've got a company that, that represented itself as the science company. And again, this was a huge scientific operation within the company. Uh, they had thousands of scientists. They were looked to as experts uh, by the federal regulatory agencies. People at EPA, people at FDA, people within the federal regulatory system would look to DuPont to tell them the truth about these chemicals. Um, you know, so you had a company that was controlling the science, was able to give information to the regulators about these health risks, and repeatedly made the decision not to do so. Business interests won out. It makes you wonder why the companies would hire these uh, experts and scientists in the first place if they're not going to give their opinion the weight that it deserves. It's also obviously um, incredibly nearsighted to judge that even from the bottom line of a business perspective, it's going to hurt you um, if you don't address those concerns, because obviously these companies uh, now are in a compromised position because of the, that culture of concealment that took hold. Uh, whether that has become a reflex that simply cannot be overcome, uh, we'll see as time goes on. We'll have a chance to probe that a little bit uh, with the second panel. Um, I'm going to um, adjourn or, or go, say, oh, no? Okay. I'm going to yield to um, uh, Congresswoman Wasserman Schultz, who's going to come take the uh, chair and ask her question uh, for five minutes. Okay, thank you. Um, I, uh, Mr. Mr. Billet, I, I have a question for you. The U.S. Navy, as you mentioned, began to raise serious concerns about the potential toxicity of firefighting foam and its harmful effects on the environment in the 1970s. Um, it was a series of alarming reports. Uh, I have the report here. And this report by the Navy noted Quote, the 3M company has not provided any useful information about the components of FC-206, which is one of 3M's fighting, firefighting foams. Would you say that this represents typical behavior for 3M, that the company has a track record of trying to suppress harmful information related to its firefighting form, foam and PFAS products? Uh, thank you for the question. Um, yeah, what I can tell you is, in our experience in litigation with 3M, one of the very first things 3M did was go to the court to get what is called a blanket protective order. Um, this is after we had been litigating with DuPont and we were able to get documents from the litigation and provide them to the regulatory agencies like EPA to warn of the health threat. Uh, when litigation began against 3M, they immediately sought a blanket protective order to prevent any of their internal documents from being shared with the public or the regulatory agencies. Um, and I believe, as uh, Ms. Swanson and, and others within the state of Minnesota uh, you know, can, can testify to, uh, that kind of 
conduct continued for many years with respect to the perfluorinated business, trying to keep uh, the information about the toxicity, the risks of these chemicals within the company. Thank you. Uh, the Navy began working with 3M to develop firefighting foams in the 1960s. It turned into a very lucrative business deal for the company. The military did studies for decades, and DOD only started thinking of the chemicals as hazardous in the late 1990s when it started to seriously explore alternatives to foams with PFOA and PFOS. The Air Force completed a transition to safer foams in 2018, and the Army is scheduled to complete this transition this year. But the Navy is not scheduled to complete its transition until next year. Mr. Billett, I know you can't speak on behalf of all of DOD, but in your view, might DOD have made this transition sooner if 3M had not been so reticent about sharing information with the military and the public? Um, I believe that probably would be possible. If the more information that had been made available about what these chemicals are, what kind of products they're in, how we're all exposed to them. If that information had been made decades earlier, I think a lot of what we're talking about here today could have been avoided. You know, the US EPA ended up bringing a lawsuit against DuPont uh, for withholding information and specifically said in that claim, if we had been given information about PFOA in particular, earlier. We could have begun looking into this decades earlier. Um, as we already heard, 3M ended up having to pay a fine as well for withholding information from EPA. Yeah, I mean, so, logic just tells you that, obviously, the more transparent they were, the, the sooner that we could have gotten to the bottom of this to address it and avoided exposing really literally thousands of people to, uh, to, to harm, harm from the impacts. Um, last question before we adjourn. In the FY20 Military Construction and Veterans Affairs Appropriations Bill, uh, I made sure, and I chair that appropriations subcommittee, that we put in $60 million in additional funding for PFOA and PFOS cleanup on military installations. Many military bases have unsafe levels of PFAS chemicals in their drinking water. And to either of you, Ms. Swanson or Mr. Billet, what more should be done by the federal government to protect our men and women in uniform? Because they really are impacted severely. Madam Chair, I think a number of things can be done. Uh, one would be to ban the use of PFAS, you know, firefighting foam for training exercises. I mean, it really is a perversity that much of the contamination occurred not by actually fighting fires, but by training how to fight fires. I think Congress can limit the ability of these chemicals to be used in training exercises, for example, and then as quickly as possible, phase out the chemicals altogether. Um, certainly classifying these substances as a hazardous substance would help uh, because the Department of Defense has been slow to come to the cleanup table, and if it were called a hazardous substance, that would certainly help and eliminate the Department of Defense's ability to say we have no obligation uh, to do that. I think um, listing uh, these chemicals under the toxic release inventory is important as well. That helps all communities so that if there is a release of these chemicals, you know, the public knows about it. and. Uh, I think that would be something that could be helpful. And then I think as well, just helping with the sampling. I mean, this is an expensive effort. I just saw, I think, in Massachusetts an announcement that the governor was appropriating some money for testing, and it was millions of dollars. And this is something that all communities are grappling with. Some communities are probably better able to pay for that than others, but that goes beyond the military, but could certainly help as well if testing were funded. It could be something Congress could do. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Billett, anything to add? Nothing to add. Okay. Thank you. And without objection, the Navy report that I referenced will be entered as a part of the record. And uh, the panel is dismissed with the thanks of the committee. And the committee stands in recess, sub to the subject to the call of the chair.
Without objection, the committee will reconvene. And further without objection, uh, the gentleman, Representative Kildee, is authorized to participate in today's hearing. Uh, glad to have you here. Uh, before we start with the witnesses, I did want to uh, make a few comments. Uh, this is a unique hearing, and I want to say a few words before we start with our next panel, which I'll introduce shortly. We have with us today representatives from three corporations, the 3M, Corp 3M Company, DuPont, and Keymores. And I believe this is the first time these companies have testified before Congress on the issue of PFAS chemicals. I'd like to welcome our panel and thank them for being here. We just heard from Lori Swanson and Rob Billet uh, in how the cases they litigated against 3M and DuPont respectively relied on a long historical record that showed both companies knew PFAS chemicals, spe specifically PFOA and PFOS, were toxic for decades and yet continued to manufacture these chemicals and carelessly discharged them into our air, our water, and our soil. As a result, Americans unwittingly drank, ate, and breathed toxic man-made chemicals for decades, chemicals that can lead to liver disease, thyroid disease, kidney disease, cancer, and more. I'm hammering home this point because PFAS contamination is an issue that is just now starting to get the attention it deserves, and companies are only recently starting to pay for what they have done. As I've mentioned, the companies represented, us, represented before us today are American institutions. They've made products Americans have been eager to buy, and they've helped create many of the conveniences of modern life. But that does not make them exempt from basic ethical standards of conduct. Part of why American capitalism has survived and thrived for as long as it has is because companies have historically treated both their workers and the larger American society responsibly and fairly in addition to turning a profit. A company is not just a CEO or a head of PR, but the hundreds and thousands of people all working to serve a specific purpose. The relationship between companies and the American people is inter interdependent. Companies make high-quality products that Americans decide to purchase, and each makes the better uh, off. And importantly, each trusts the other implicitly to participate in the marketplace in good faith. So when that covenant is broken, when the American people learn that companies have obscured and suppressed evidence and the chemicals they use and manufacture are toxic, it is a seismic event. I mean it because it shakes the foundation of democratic capitalism. And that's why we are here today, not just to try and help gain some semblance of justice for the affected people who lived in contaminated communities, but also to ensure companies are held accountable for what can only be described as violating the trust of the American people. I certainly recognize that our panel here today represents companies that have, in some cases, undergone a lot of changes, including but not limited to corporate restructuring and changes in management over the past several decades. Chemours didn't even exist until 2015, when it was spun off from DuPont. But our subcommittee doesn't accept that these changes in corporate structure let the current incarnation of the company off the hook. A company is tied to its past, morally responsible for its past, and must answer for its past, no matter what changes have occurred from point A to point B. In the same way, a nation must contend with and be responsible for actions taken decades ago, even though there have been changes in government and leadership since then. This is Congress, the people's body, not a courtroom. And the American people recognize that companies don't just disappear into thin air because a few people in a boardroom somewhere decided that a merger and a few spinoffs might improve the company's bottom line. So I hope we don't spend this hearing trying to ping pong responsibility back and forth between two companies or debating whether or not the DuPont that exists today is the same DuPont that dumped PFAS into the water. It also does not work to simply deny the science linking PFAS to serious health effects in Americans and try to leave Americans who were poisoned up to their own uh, devices to clean up your mess. So I hope that we can all start from a common baseline, and that is the scientific consensus that PFAS chemicals, and especially the long chain chemicals like PFOA and PFOS, are harmful to human health. Let's not get sucked into the rabbit hole of more research needs to be done because you know what? That excuse can be and has been used to justify inaction, and the American people are smart enough to see that excuse for what it is. 
It's 2019. And if these chemicals are killing people, let's stop using them and let's get them out of our environment. I call on each company here today to come to the table, work with Congress and the EPA to address this national emer emergency. The lives of each and every American depend on it. So with that, I'd like to swear the witnesses in. Thank you for rising. Uh, you swear to affirm Swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God. Thank you. Please sit down. The record uh, shows that the witnesses answered in the affirmative. Uh, we have three witnesses here. We have Daryl Roberts, Chief Operating and Engineering Officer with DuPont. Uh, Denise Rutherford, Senior Vice President of Corporate Affairs, the 3M Company. Paul Kirsch, President of Fluoro Products, uh, the Keymores Company. And with that, we will move to you, Ms. Rutherford, to uh, start with your oral testimony for five minutes. Please note that the mic microphones are very sensitive. Make sure you turn on uh, when you're asked a question or when you're presenting. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Chairman Rauda, Ranking Member Comer, and distinguished members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today. My name is Denise Rutherford, and I am the Senior Vice President of Corporate Affairs at 3M, reporting directly to our Chairman and CEO. In this role, my responsibilities include sustainability initiatives, environmental stewardship, and public policy. I joined 3M as a senior research chemist in 1989 after obtaining my PhD in chemistry at Colorado State University, and I've been a 3M'er for nearly 30 years. We are a company of scientists and engineers who are committed to applying science to help solve some of the world's biggest challenges. Our core mission is to create products that are essential to improving people's lives, and the innovations produced by 3Mers have benefited millions. These innovative products have, include countless examples that are vital to everyday life, from materials in smartphones, low emission vehicles, airplanes, and renewable energy, to our products like EKJ electrodes, worker safety products, and familiar products like scotch tape and post-it notes. In all our work, we are guided by a deep commitment to people, to science, and to the quality and safety of our products. This commitment extends to the topic that I'm here to testify about today, industry's use of certain per- and polyfluoroalkyl substances, or PFAS, and the state of scientific knowledge about their effects on people and the environment. While PFAS is a very small fraction of 3M's overall business, we take our stewardship responsibility extremely seriously. At 3M, we have spent decades studying PFAS compounds, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to share what we've learned with the subcommittee and to listen to the subcommittee's concerns on this important topic. I am proud that 3M has had a long-standing commitment to environmental stewardship. That commitment extends to our industry-leading, decades-long effort to improve technologies and scientific understanding related to PFAS, and includes our decision to voluntarily phase out production of PFOS and PFOA. We were an industry leader in this respect, and since our decision to phase out these compounds almost 20 years ago, others in the industry eventually followed suit. As a result, the most recent CDC testing shows that levels of PFOS and PFOA in humans have declined by more than 20, 70%, 70%. This shows that progress is possible and we are headed in the right direction. We are committed to continuing down that path and working with Congress and regulators to develop a collaborative science-based approach to concerns about PFAS. In my written testimony, I outlined five key principles of our proposed path forward. First is our commitment to ongoing remediation at sites where we produced or disposed of PFAS. We believe this is an important responsibility as a manufacturer and as a member of the communities where we live and work. Second is our commitment to ensure appropriate disposal of firefighting foams known as AFFF. 3M ceased producing and selling AFFF more than a decade ago. We will continue to work with our former customers to ensure that unused 3M firefighting foam is properly handled and when appropriate, we will take that product back from those former customers. Third is the need for nationwide science-based regulation. 
We support EPA's PFAS action plan and Congress's efforts to expedite timelines for the EPA to decide whether to say, set nationwide drinking water standards. Fourth, we propose establishing a clearinghouse for sharing best practices on detection, measurement, and remediation. Finally, we call for coordinated research into PFAS. We believe a respected, established, and independent scientific body should be called upon to conduct a comprehensive review of the existing science on PFAS, inform the public of the findings, and set an agenda for continued research. If we come together, if all relevant stakeholders can come together, we can develop a path forward. We commit to working to Congress and concerned parties as an active, responsible participant in the dialogue and to continuing to drive science-based progress through appropriate actions. Thank you for the opportunity to present this testimony. We are looking forward to working with the subcommittee. Thank you, Ms. Rutherford. Mr. Kirsch, five minutes for your opening statement. Thank you, Chairman Ruta, Ranking Member Comer, and members of the subcommittee for inviting me here today to testify on behalf of the Comores Company. My name is Paul Kirsch, and I'm the president of the floral products business at Comores. My role since I joined the company in June of 2016. I also serve as the executive sponsor for the Comores Corporate Responsibility Commitments. Like you and others who have come before this subcommittee, I want to leave my children and grandchildren a cleaner, better world. I don't merely empathize with public concerns over the presence of PFAS in drinking water and the broader environment. I share it. The public is rightly concerned over drinking water quality and Comores, like all companies, must do its part. Let me assure you, our entire team takes very seriously the obligation to manage PFAS compounds in our manufacturing processes in a responsible way and ensure they are safe for their intended use. I've been asked to provide some background regarding the formation of Comores and the details of its spinoff from DuPont. Comores was established on July 2015, July, July 1st, 2015, as an independent, publicly traded company. From day one, we faced serious challenges given how DuPont unilaterally designed the spinoff, including a deliberate disproportionate assignment of two-thirds of DuPont's environmental liabilities, 90% of its active litigation, as well as an obligation to indemnify DuPont for all assigned environmental liabilities, should any regulatory, public, or private plaintiff seek to hold DuPont accountable. And if that wasn't enough, DuPont mandated a $4 billion payment from Comores in the form of a dividend. To our knowledge, there has been no other spinoff like this in terms of debt, as well as the indemnification provisions which have no cap on time or money. DuPont designed the separation of Comores to create a company where it could dump its liabilities to protect itself from environmental cleanup and related responsibilities. From my written testimony, you can clearly see that despite the financial condition DuPont left us in at the time of the spinoff and the legacy issues we inherited, Comores moved quickly and with a sense of urgency to transform the company and take action against these, to address these historical issues. At Comores, we live up to our commitments with actions, not just words. The $200 million investment we have made in our Fayetteville, North Carolina facility is just an example of that. From this investment, we are creating a best-in-class emissions control facility that can serve as a model for other chemical manufacturing facilities around the globe. This facility took tens of thousands of hours to design and will reduce air and wastewater emissions of all PFAS by 99% or greater by the end of this year. The commitment to reduce air and wastewater emissions of all PFAS by 99% or greater is not just for our Fayetteville facility, but for all of our sites. It's part of our 10 ambitious corporate responsibility commitments that we, now, we announced a year ago. These commitments are both impactful and measurable. Besides the PFAS emission goal, a first in the chemical manufacturing industry, these commitments also include environmental, environmental goals for greenhouse gases, and landfill intensity. While Comores has only existed as an independent company for four years, we operate with a mature understanding that economic progress and environmental protection are not contradictory. They can and they must go together. The products we make enable critical components used in the medical, aerospace, automotive, semiconductor, communications, and energy industries. 
For example, a major product produced at our Fayetteville site not only enables renewable energy storage, but it will be critical in, in enabling the hydrogen economy with the next generation of fuel cells for the automotive market. And the types of commitments we have made enable us to manufacture our products in ways that meet the expectation of a world that demands more. We believe collaboration and transparency are critical to better understanding this issue and addressing public concern. We support the federal legislative efforts currently underway and their goals to develop a safe regulatory framework for PFAS compounds using a science-based approach. Comor has provided input to the Senate Environment and Public Works Committee on the PFAS provisions in the Senate NDAA bill, and we support the measures that resulted from that process in the Senate bill as passed. Comoros also supports EPA's process to determine whether legacy long-chain PFAS chemicals should be designated as hazardous substances under the Superfund law. However, we do understand Congress may move on this issue legislatively and would welcome the opportunity to, gauge, to engage with members should this be the case. In closing, we can't change the actions or decisions taken by others in the past, which, we continue, which continue to impact us today, we can only control the decisions in front of us. We believe that our record, even in our earliest days as a new company, demonstrates our commitment to being a different kind of chemistry company, one dedicated to taking a leadership role in environmental stewardship. Thank you again for the opportunity to be here today. I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Kirsch. Mr. Roberts, the floor is yours for five minutes and opening testimony. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Comer, and members of the subcommittee. My name is Darrell Roberts, and I'm the Chief Operations and Engineering Officer for DuPont. I attended Howard University on a ROTC scholarship and earned a degree in chemical engineering. I served as a commissioned Army Reserve Officer for eight years, during which time I started my career at Eastman Kodak and earned a Master's in Occupational Health and Safety from the University of Rochester and an MBA from Rochester Institute of Technology. I then worked in health and safety roles and senior leadership for Arkema, a diversified chemicals company. Just over a year ago, I joined DuPont because I was, and still am, excited about the opportunity to work for a mission-driven company that is focused on making the planet a better place for my daughter's generation and beyond. The new DuPont appreciates this opportunity to address the subcommittee's questions about PFAS. We're pleased to be here today to endorse specific legislative proposals and congressional efforts to protect public health and the environment. Let me first explain why I refer to my company as the new DuPont. EI DuPont D. Nemours and Company, historically known as DuPont, has evolved throughout the course of its history, often adding and removing business lines. For example, in 2004, the fibers business became a separate company called Invista. And in 2013, the coatings business became a separate company called Exalta. In 2015, the performance chemicals business, a long-held business within the DuPont family, became a separate company called Comores. Comores took the floral products technologies, operations, sites, customers, technical expertise, and executive leadership in the formation of its new company. Their CEO ran the business line. Their executives made decisions about the business line for many, many years and their plants made the products we're talking about today. Most recently, Historical DuPont merged with the, du the Dow Company and then split into three separate independent companies, Dow, Corteva, and the new DuPont, which I represent. With respect to Comores, which has become a very profitable, freestanding business, I would say no one wants to hear two companies argue about litigation. This is not about money here today. They want to hear about how we're going to work with Congress on legislation which is what the new DuPont wants to do. The new DuPont is a specialty products company dedicated to solving some of the world's most pressing challenges, including those identified in the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. For example, to address the world's food shortages, we have developed technologies to increase food shelf life. To address greenhouse gas emissions, we have developed materials to lightweight cars and, and planes. And we can all agree that our first responders deserve the very best protective equipment so we continue to make the best-in-class performance fibers for flame-resistant materials and body armor. We do all of this by employing more than 14,000 Americans across 28 states. 
The focus of today's hearing is PFAS. The new DuPont does not manufacture PFAS. Like many other companies today, we use some PFAS materials. However, our use is extremely limited. Nevertheless, we recognize these are important issues, and that's why we support legislative proposals addressing PFAS. They are requiring EPA to set a national primary drinking water regulation for PFAS within two years, requiring toxic release inventory reporting on certain PFASs, including PFOA and PFOS, requiring EPA to set pretreatment and effluent standards for PFAS by 2022, and requiring EPA to list PFOA and PFOS as hazardous substances within one year under CERCLA. We encourage Congress to enact these proposals as part of the National Defense Authorization Act. While Congress considers this legislation, we're moving forward with our own commitments. As this subcommittee recognized in a prior hearing, the vast majority of PFAS contamination is caused by firefighting foams. We do not manufacture or sell firefighting foams and have never done so. However, like countless other companies, we purchase foams for protection of our facilities. We are committed to ending all use of PFAS firefighting foams at our facilities by the end of 2021. We have also reaffirmed our commitment to not make, buy, or use long-chain PFAS materials. We will eliminate, by the end of this year, our limited use of long-chain PFAS in a recently integrated operation, which is the only instance where we use it today, and we are immediately working to eliminate it. We will provide free access to our product steward software. We will also grant free licenses to others to what, to that, that want to use our PFAS remediation using our water treatment technologies, which we'll make available for free. And we will provide research funding for PFAS remediation. And of course, we'll continue to fulfill our commitment to, to remediate our sites. We look forward to today's hearing and how we can work together to further our shared goals of sustainability, innovation, and responsible product stewardship. Thank you, Mr. Roberts. The chair now recognizes Representative Talib for five minutes of questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as we discussed in earlier um, subcommittee uh, previous kind of hearings, we've also discussed DuPont's own scientific research that demonstrated links between exposure of PFAS and a variety of very serious uh, health concerns. So, Mr. Roberts, I wanted to start by asking about DuPont's current PFAS-related responsibilities. Is it your opinion that since the 2005, uh, is it Kamar's spinoff, New, New DuPont is no longer involved in development and marketing P PFAS chemicals? Congresswoman, that is correct. So regardless of all the money DuPont made over the decades with PFAS chemicals, is it your opinion that New DuPont do, I can't stand that you guys call it new. DuPont. DuPont, which is right now capitalized with those profits, is not liable for the unpaid cost of cleaning up contamination and comp compensating for the human injuries that DuPont ca caused. Yeah. Congresswoman, what we're accountable for is to represent and to ensure that we clean up sites which we own and operate. So, so even though you contaminated other sites, you don't want to pay for that? You know, Congresswoman, I would, I would How about injuries, people dying? Yeah. Congresswoman, Medical I Medical costs. Yeah, if I may? Congresswoman, by all means, the sites that we own and operate, we're fully committed to continuing to work and to remediate. No, it's lawyer oh. talk when you say own and operate. I'm talking about you, when you, you contaminate other properties, we, so you walk away, you're Con not going to clean those up. Yeah. Congresswoman, we did not walk away from those sites. Mm. I, I'll be very clear in saying that our performance chemicals division of DuPont, which was renamed as Comores, is still operating those sites. Okay. So the same individuals that were operating those sites, that were making decisions on those sites, that were it was extracting profit from those sites and are still extracting profit from those sites, as, as I read in the written testimony from Comores, are fully committed to cleaning them up. So, Despite so, a growing, growing scientific consensus within the company that PFOA was toxic and was contaminating local environments, DuPont purposely hid the research from affected communities and government regulators. Glenn Evers, a former DuPont research scientist, testified before this committee, subcommittee about DuPont's effort to suppress this research on the toxicity of PFAS chemicals and DuPont's effort to limit Mr. Evers' opportunity to discuss his research, as well as retaliation against him for discussing his work with the EPA. Mr. Roberts, are you aware of these efforts to suppress DuPont's own employees' research concerning the company's development, use, and the health risk of PFAS? Yeah. 
chemicals? Congresswoman, I, I can tell you that I'm not aware of that as I was not present at that time. What I can tell you is that the company that I work for is fully committed to working sure. in a way where we're transparent, is where we work with our communities in a way where they understand what we do. We understand our requirement to ensure. So you're not aware of that, but is DuPont, um, the original manufacturer of Teflon, in any way responsible for sh shielding critical information from the public? Congressman, no company should shield critical information from the public. The company that I work for is completely focused on making sure that when we yeah. have information that we communicate it, that we work and that our product stewardship efforts are critical in what we do every day, that the communities in which we operate, that we share information, that we work with our regulators to establish the right regulation. That's why we're here today. I understand. To completely support Well, I'm here because I represent 650,000 people that are being harmed by, by PFAS exposure, and we're trying to get to the truth here and trying to bring it forward, not talk about who owns what or whatever. We're trying to figure out who is responsible, right? So more recently, in 2009, DuPont received approval from the Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA, to start making Gen X commercially as a replacement for POFA. FOA, which persists indefinitely in the environment and is linked to cancer and other serious illnesses. The agreement passed to Chemours um, in 2015 when DuPont formed the company from business units that included the manufacturing of Gen X at the, uh, I think it's Fayette Phil um, Works plant in North Carolina. Mr. Roberts, is this a depiction accurate? Uh, is, the, is it correct that DuPont's Gen X manufacturing passed to Camars in 2015? Uh, Congresswoman, it is correct that the Camars company owns and operates the facility which is in Fayetteville. That's okay. correct. Mr. Kirsch, so it is, um, all, is it also accurate to state that it is new DuPont's position or whatever, that only Camars is now responsible for what is once DuPont's Gen X manufacturing operations? I, I believe that's what's, Congresswoman, that's what's written in the spinoff document, yes. In our earlier subcommittee um, hearing, we heard from um, Emily Devon, a North Carolina resident living um, near Cape uh, Fear River, which is dealing with PFAS contamination, including PFA, uh, PFOS, and Gen X chemicals. Ms. Donovan expressed concerns that have emerged in her local community related to that exposure in these emerging PFAS chemicals and links to cancers, immune disorders, and so forth. Dr. DeWitt uh, even described Gen X chemicals as quite toxic and not safe. So Mr. Roberts, the people in North Carolina, Carolina who live, this, live by this uh, plant are very sick, and DuPont played a role in poisoning them. So in my opinion, I think it means that DuPont needs to help Camaras fix that crisis. Uh, and so will you commit today to working with Camaras to clean up the waterworks plant in North Carolina? Congressman, we're here today to commit to clean up the sites that we own and operate. Camorris is fully capable of cleaning up the sites that it owns, operates, and continues to drive profits to its shareholders by operating. They're fully, as we've heard from them, from their CEO, from their leadership, they're in great financial position. There's no reason that they would require our help to clean up their sites. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. The Chair now rep uh, recognizes Representative Gibbs. Thank you, Chairman. Ms. Rutherford, I think I heard you say in your oral testimony that 3M has, has ceased uh, uh, producing uh, P PFOS and PFOA, is that correct? Is that yes, Congressman, that's correct. How long ago was that? I didn't uh, Congressman, we announced that phase out in May of the year 2000, and we completed the phase out within just a couple of years after that for the, those two compounds, PFOA and PFOS. Did you do that based on your, your research, or were you forced to do that? No, we did this voluntarily, Congressman. Thank you for that question. We discovered in the late 90s, as our testing capabilities improved, we were able to find these materials in the environment in places that we didn't expect to find them, and at concentrations, really low, low concentrations. But as we move forward, we saw that these did bioaccumulate, meaning that they would build up over time with continued exposure for these two particular materials. Mm -hmm. We voluntarily then took the action to phase out. We worked closely with the EPA, the Clinton EPA at that time, to develop that exit plan and to communicate our rationale for doing so. We did this without any information, any, any awareness. There is still no cause and effect relationship for the ad, any adverse human. Okay, th th thank you. I guess for all three of you, um, I mentioned this in the first uh, panel. There's 5,000 known substances that are under this classification of PFOS, and um, 
are all these chemicals the same st structure? Because there's some, my understanding, there's some that testing would be tough and, um, you know, I, I just I should your reaction about should we handle this as a class or should we figure out which ones are, might be harmful to the environment and human health or, you know, see where I'm going here? Can, can I? Congressman, we, we don't believe all these chemicals are the same. That's why we support legislation to uh, list PFOA and PFOS and only those two as hazardous substances under CERCLA. That's further than the other companies here are, are, are willing to go today, but that's what we believe is correct. What we know about those chemicals is that they're biopersistent. Uh, that's enough to know that there's a clear concern for those chemicals within society at this point in time, and we feel for that reason that they should be regulated. On the larger class, we believe it's appropriate to have the EPA continue to gain information for us to to drive science-based regulation once we have additional data on the larger cast of chemicals. They can't all be looked at the same, but I think we know enough about, about those which are called C8s or, or extremely biopersistent to say that uh, that's an appropriate action at this point in time. Now, with all these 5,000 different compounds, how's it, the interaction between the companies and the EPA, how's that interaction work to, to, to develop the science-based and get the real facts of what's going on, what, what compounds might be harmful and what ones might not be? Anybody can answer, all three of you, whoever wants to. Uh, Congressman, I'd be happy to address that question. As we've worked at the EPA over many, many years and many administrations, we, we have engaged on a scientist-to-scientist -to -scientist basis. And that work has continued to share the studies we have, the body of evidence in, in, the, in the public domain, as well as the work conducted by our own EPA to do risk assessments uh, in, as part of the process for setting a nationwide science-based standard. Uh, that work has continued. We appreciate and support the new action plan to do that in an expedited manner. We believe our country is best served to continue to allow the EPA to exercise that, that process and not to proceed with a hazardous designation under CERCLA unless it is decided by the EPA through their normal process, sir. Okay. Go ahead, Mr. Kirsch. Yeah. <laughs> Congressman, we agree uh, that the, um, the class or the 5,000 substances that represent PFAS uh, are not all the same. Uh, they vary in their uses from the pharmaceutical industry through aviation, as I mentioned earlier, and automotives. So regulating them as an entire class, we believe, would be a mistake. To the question about how we work with uh, different uh, regulatory bodies, we've spent time and we are spending time uh, even in the present with different congressional bodies, uh, both in the House and the Senate, as, long with, uh, as well with the EPA and with the state of North Carolina as a result of the, uh, the efforts that we put in place there. Okay, well, I, I think, uh, like I said earlier, we need to make sure that we're protecting the environment and health, human health, but at the same token, make sure we're not throwing the baby out with the bathwater. And uh, I don't think a lot of people realize that there's this many thousands of compounds under this cl general classification, so we have to be careful how we handle that, Mr. Chairman. And I think that's a prudent point, because a lot of these uh, compounds are actually, I think, beneficial and uh, we need to limit, figure out the ones that aren't. That's where the science comes in. I, I know somebody made a comment about science as an excuse, and, and uh, I don't think that's true. I think uh, we need to get the facts and do what's right, right for everybody. So I owe you back. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, chair now recognizes Representative Kildee. You're up. Uh, first of all, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for um, allowing me to participate in this hearing. And thank you especially for your leadership on this question uh, and for holding what has been, I think, a very informative series of hearings. Um, I'm not going to be redundant by asking some of the same questions. I'd like to make a bit of a statement, but I want to clarify something before I move forward. Mr. Roberts, uh, could you reiterate what you said about what compounds should, in your opinion or the opinion of your company, should be regulated under CERCLA? Sure. For, for us, the compounds of PFOA? and PFOS, which are the two C8 chemistries which are considered long chain. Uh, they are the chemistries which we recognize as being highly biopersistent, meaning they have half-lives that can uh, be greater than a year. Um, because of that connection to uh, biopersistence, that's the reason why we uh, believe that those are the chemicals that should be uh, uh, considered for CERCLA. Okay. Uh, uh, I, thought, I, thought, I thought that's what I understood you to say, and I guess I'm kind of 
a little bit puzzled. Uh, I think you mentioned, Mr. Roberts, uh, that Comores has adequate financial resources to deal with uh, any financial liability for cleanup or for any uh, liability that might emanate out of uh, health concerns as a result of these chemical contaminants. Mr. Kirsch, is your position that Comores was provided with adequate financial resources as a part of the spinoff to deal with what obviously would be a pretty significant uh, cost to deal with cleanup and other liability issues? Uh, thank you for the question, Congressman. The, the answer would be a clear no, and I think the, uh, the amended complaint that you all received um, has a couple uh, interesting examples, and I will, I will mention one, and it gets back to the North Carolina situation. The maximum liability that DuPont estimated for North Carolina in the spinoff was $2.09 million, and as I mentioned in my uh, oral remarks, that, that cleanup effort and stopping the emissions in that facility will cost us uh, well north of $200 million. So, so this, is, this is the concern that many of us have, is that we hear from one witness who has offloaded their liability that they think that the chemicals of, uh, in question should be regulated under CERCLA, but that the company that does have liability has not been given adequate resources to deal with that obligation. And listening to the witness representing 3M, you want to get credit for the, the, the decision to no longer produce these dangerous chemicals voluntarily, but in the same breath want us to believe that there's no science that says that these chemicals are dangerous at all. So if you're responsible for the creation and the promulgation of these chemicals in the environment, you can offload the obligation to somebody else who doesn't have enough resource. And if you create these chemicals that then contaminate people and affect their lives, you can take credit for the fact that you're taking it out of, the, out of, out of commerce and no longer putting it into the environment, but on the same token say that there's nothing saying this is dangerous. This is ridiculous. This is ridiculous. We have a huge problem in this country. People I represent, for example, in this, the town of Oscoda, Michigan, who hosted an Air Force base, the Wurtsmouth Air Force Base, had their groundwater contaminated, have had their way of life affected. It's a part of Michigan. It's right on the shore of Lake Huron. It's a beautiful part of our state where the culture is one of hunting and fishing, where now you can't hunt the animals because the groundwater has contaminated them. You can't eat the fish that you catch because they're too dangerous to consume. And we have companies that have benefited and made millions and billions of dollars by selling these products into commerce who now want to point the finger at somebody else or say, well, we're not going to produce these chemicals anymore, but believe me, there's no science that says they're safe. I take issue with that. There's plenty of science. There's plenty of science out there that demonstrates these are harmful chemicals and dangerous for human consumption. Otherwise, you wouldn't have taken them off the market in the first place. Mr. Chairman, thank you for holding this hearing. This has been quite elucidating. And I think what we're hearing today, I think, makes the case that we can't sit and wait for voluntary action, even though I think, obviously, we would appreciate action. Congress has to act. It's the only way we're going to get to this problem at a scale equal to the problem. Thank you very much. Thank you. The Chair now recognizes Representative Gosar for five minutes of questioning. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Ms. Rutherford, what role does science play in EPA's chemical regulatory process, and what type of information does EPA consider as part of this process? Yes, thank you for the question, Congressman. The EPA has a very rigorous scientific process that is, is fundamental to its decisions. As, as I understand it, our scientists work closely with those scientists uh, in a variety of materials. You can appreciate for a company that has 50,000 different products, uh, we, are, we are engaged with regulators. We take our responsibility for our products and our, the safety of those products very, very seriously. And as we've engaged with them, the EPA has been able to develop processes that um, set appropriate regulations and nationwide science-based standards for us over many years. So 
is there legal or other possible ramifications if the EPA does not base its regulatory actions on sound science? Um, Congressman, I, that's an interesting question. I'm not a legislator or a member of uh, the EPA. Uh, our concern would be that uh, our, our actions speak for ourselves. We've been engaged with our communities in remediation uh, at our own manufacturing facilities and, and dealing with these issues over, over years. It has resulted in, in remediation, improving water quality in our communities. The blood levels in, in, in the Americans has dropped by more than 70 percent. Actions speak louder than words. We're concerned that uh, should legislative action result in um, a lot more conversation and, and arguments, it would prevent us from taking action uh, in the communities and improving water quality. So I guess my question is, is I, you know, uh, it, it goes about so the sound science, is, is um, 3M's uh, protocol, were they instrumental in actually constructing some of the protocols that are found at the EPA? Uh, Congressman, I, I wouldn't be so bold as to say we're, we're that instrumental, but we have been engaged in, in testing these materials over many years. It, it, it was our scientific understand our scientists our scientists excuse me who were instrumental in developing some of the analytical techniques that allow us now to detect these materials down to the parts per trillion level and so as we are engaged in testing and in active remediation around our own sites we are able to detect these materials and that is a technique that uh, was supported by 3M and many others in the industry quite honestly to enable the EPA to uh, further it's uh, the interest of the Americans uh, addressing water quality. So what you're telling me is is the technology has changed to evaluate um, the chemistry, uh, the evaluation, uh, defining bio uh, accumulation. That's evolved, hasn't it? I mean, uh, once upon a time, uh, science said that the earth was flat. Is it flat? <laughs> Uh, Congressman, I, I, we all know that's not the case. Uh, the world is round. And, you know, our, our, our approach in advancing the science has, has evolved over time. Uh, when we first uh, produced these materials, we conducted certain tests that were required by the EPA. Additional tests are now required. We are absolutely committed to that degree of compliance. Both the standards and our understanding of these materials, our ability to detect today is, um, is far beyond what it was 20 to 30 years ago. Well, most of the time, um, rules and regulatory state actually comes from reactions, not being proactive. So how do you look at this aspect in being proactive? I mean, you know, it's kind of hard to see into the future. Um, but once again, uh, science gives us some predicated outcomes, you know, particularly a scientific method that if I perform certain processes, I get a result, and I turn them back over to you. You do the same processes and get the same result. That's how science has evolved to today. Mm -hmm. So how, how have you looked at your process that's been proactive versus reactive? Congressman, that's, a, that's an interesting perspective. And what I can say is that 3M conducts our own research. We also support um, in, in, by terms of grants to universities for them to conduct research in an unrestricted way. So th that research continues to expand the body of knowledge. Uh, those are peer-reviewed journals. That helps to advance the understanding that we all have of these particular materials in the environment. We've been studying this for many, many years, our own workforce, scientific studies. We see there are associations in these studies. We see a lot of inconsistencies in those data, and the data simply don't show any cause and effect relationships at historical levels of these materials in the environment, either the older materials or the newer materials. But yet we continue to advance the science so that we can truly understand the situation. One indulgence real quick. Are there other industries that your metrics have been beneficial to, other than the chemistry, uh, like DuPont and 3M? Sorry, could you Are there other industries that have benefited from your quantitative evaluations in a proactive manner? Uh, certainly. We're, we're very active in several industries where precise measurements are required. For instance, uh, the advances in electronics have, have been enabled by, by some of our materials going into electronic devices. Uh, transportation, uh, low emission vehicles, aerospace, all of those industries benefit by the dedication of, of all of our scientific companies here in the U.S. Mining as well, right? Absolutely. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. The chair now rep recognizes Representative Ocasio-Cortez.
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for holding this hearing and ensuring that we don't let this go until we get some real answers on this issue. Um, this committee has heard stories of families whose babies have had their brains damaged for their entire lives by PFAS chemicals, women who have been rendered infertile for their entire lives, stage four cancer, people whose families have been torn apart by lupus and diabetes, and who have lost um, many family members to this disease. Ms. Rutherford, I want to spend some time here discussing some of 3M's current tactics when it comes to um, accepting responsibility for PFAS or not accepting responsibility for PFAS contamination. Um, are you aware of 3M's membership to an organization entitled Responsible Science Policy Coalition? Congresswoman, we are members of many trade associations and that is one of those. Uh, how much money does 3M give to this coalition? I'm not aware of that actual number, Congresswoman. Okay. Uh, are you aware of any other chemical companies that are members of the Responsible Science Policy Coalition? Uh, again, I will reiterate, we're members of many trade associations. We do that in order to advance our perspective, advance, share our perspective, and, and to share our, our science. And Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I would like to enter into the record a presentation by the Responsible Science Policy Coalition dated July 24, 2018, which lists 3M as a key member. Without objection, so moved. Thank you very much. In the lobbying materials by the coalition, it states, and I quote, the weight of current scientific evidence does not show that PFOS or PFOA cause, cause adverse uh, health effects in humans at current rates of exposure. Ms. Rutherford, do you agree with this statement? Congresswoman, I absolutely agree with that statement. This statement goes against 3M's own scientists who for decades have been studying these chemicals and terming them, quote, toxic. For instance, in 1999, Richard Purdy, one of 3M's own scientists, an environmental specialist, resigned his position in protest, calling PFAS, quote, the most insidious pollutant since PCB. Additionally, this administration's Agency for Toxic Substance, Substances and Disease Registry released a toxicology profile of PFAS chemicals. In the profile, the agency states, quote, the available epidemiology studies suggest associations between per, uh, perfluorical exposure and several health outcomes. They then go on to list a myriad of serious health outcomes, including increased risk of thyroid disease, liver damage, increased risk of decreased fertility, and decreased antibody response to vaccines. Even during the state of Minnesota's lawsuit against 3M, 3M claimed that there were no proven negative health effects of PFAS exposure on human health. Um, Mr. Rutherford, are you, uh, Ms. Rutherford, are you aware of the efforts made by 3M in the past to conceal the risks of PFAS for more than 60 years? Con Congresswoman, I cannot, I am not familiar with that. That it goes mm -hmm. against everything I know about my company as a scientist over these mm -hmm. past 30 years. We are committed to advancing the science and to sharing information to the public domain. Mm -hmm. And if that's the case, why is 3M taking a position of denying the scientific findings of its own scientists? A large part of the scientific community and the, own, and the current administration by joining organizations that are spreading misinformation about PFAS. Congresswoman, respectfully, I disagree with that characterization. We have a team of epidemiologists and toxicologists who do report to me. I've spent hours and hours with them going through these studies. There, is, there are a lot of inconsistencies in the data. We mm -hmm. accept that there are associations, which are like leads, places that we should continue to look. And we are, in fact, doing that. But when we look at that evidence, there's no cause and effect for adverse human health effects at the levels that we are exposed to right. as a so general population. Right, so it may not be causal, but it's very associative, I see here. Um, has 3M or any agent of 3M taken meetings in the last year with lawmakers and told them or their staff that there is no negative health effects of PFAS on human health? Congresswoman, we have a very active team of representatives here working with policymakers to share information. We are very transparent mm -hmm. about that. We do that. We, we report and register all of but our But is that information, has 3M or an agent of 3M told lawmakers that there is no negative health effects to PFAS? We have shared with uh, legislators, policymakers, Congresswoman, 
the same statement that you have repeated back to me, mm -hmm. that the weight of scientific evidence shows no adverse human health effects at current or former levels. So 3M is telling lawmakers to not be concerned about this? No, we are saying that we should be concerned. We, we, we do request uh, additional studies. And, but what we can say is we've been studying our own workforce for more than 40 years. These are people who had occupational exposure at much higher levels than the general population. We do not see, looking at the scientific evidence of our own workforce, adverse human health effects. And has this point ever been communicated to senior officials of the Trump administration? I am not aware of that, Congresswoman. We have been working with uh, regulators and policymakers. Thank you very much. Thank you. The chair now recognizes Representative Keller for five minutes of questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, glad to be here today to, um, to learn more about the effects of PFAS. And it's all our concern that we have a healthy uh, community, healthy water, and a healthy environment. Uh, Dr. Rutherford, you know, I, I've been listening to the exchange going back and forth about PFAS and potential potential harms, and I, I heard you say, and I'm going to make sure I understood it correctly, that in your workforce you hadn't seen that the exposure of the employees of 3M had had a negative impact on their health. Is that correct? Congresswoman, that is, that is indeed correct, and thank you for the question. We've been, um, as all chemical manufacturers will do, monitoring our own workforce over many, many years, uh, dating back into early operations both in Minnesota and in Alabama and other facilities. We see no adverse human health effects associated with the exposures that, to which they were exposed. And again, that's many times higher than general population. Now, now this wouldn't be just your view or 3M's view. Do others believe that this to be the case as well, such as any government agencies? Uh, Congressman, many governments have studied this issue. It's a very complex issue, uh, sub, and it, it's worthy of further study. Other governments, such as Australia, Department of Health, uh, Canada's Ministry of Health, have made similar conclusions that the data are inconsistent, yet that the data available today show no conclusive evidence of cause and effect relationships creating adverse human health. And, and uh, you know, just some fluoropolymers, uh, you know, compounds of PFAS, they're used in, in a wide variety of things, even medical devices and those kind of things. Is that, is that correct? Congressman, that's correct. These uh, fluoropolymers are used in many very important applications, such as aircraft engines, uh, low emission vehicles, uh, renewable energy, um, uh, just to name a few, electronics. But, but in the case of medical devices, you know, that, that would be something that would be covered under the Food and Drug Administration if there were some negative impacts. We would certainly think that uh, a branch of the United States government, such as the Food and Drug Administration, would be concerned. Um, if these pose that kind of risk when using them for medical devices. Would that be an accurate assumption to, 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 to follow? Uh, yes, Congressman, that would be an accurate assumption. These are used in medical devices. Uh, several of my, my um, fellow witnesses have spoken to that, that these are key components in a, in a variety of devices all around us every day to enable performance. Okay. Again, I just want to make sure that, that when we look at anything as Congress, that we, we follow the science and the actual science, and I'll, I'll say this, not the political science of, of trying to advance an agenda, but the actual science of how this impacts the lives of Americans and making sure that while we want to make sure everybody's safe, we have the tools and we have the ability to have those tools made available, whether it's for, for low emissions to help our environment, whether it's for medical devices to help us um, look for ways that we could be healthier or prevent diseases, uh, we need to make sure that we let the science do it and not as Congress uh, tell the scientists how to do their job. So uh, any other government agencies, because it's not just the Food and Drug Administration, we also have a government agency called OSHA, mm -hmm. and de they deal with safety of Americans and people that work in America. So again, I would just uh, encourage the other members of this committee to make sure that we let the actual science dictate what we do and not the political science. Thank you. Thank you. The chair now recognizes Representative Hill for five minutes of questioning. Thank you. I appreciate my uh, colleague's commitment to science, and I would urge us to ensure that those who are funding the science are indeed uh, 
uh, objective. As we know, oil companies funded the science that denied climate change for many, many years. Um, I have to say I'm very glad that these three companies decided to show up here today. The country, our groundwater, and our people have been poisoned by chemicals made, used, and improperly disposed of by the companies in this room. The question is, who is going to pay for the injuries and the cleanup? These companies or the taxpayers? And here's one thing that really bothers me. DuPont is trying to use corporations law to ensure that they are not on the hook for these costs. DuPont spun off its chemical business in 2015 into a new independent company, Chemours, and according to the complaint Chemours recently, and I'm sorry if I'm not pronouncing this right, my French is a little rusty, uh, recently filed against DuPont. DuPont then saddled the new company with liability costs that were dramatically underestimated at the time the spinoff was finalized. Next, DuPont merged with another company, Dow Chemical, and then spun off a company that they refer to as New DuPont. The sole purpose of these corporate restructuring seems to be the creation of a legal fiction that someone else is responsible for all the documented harms that DuPont per perpetrated, dumping PFAS chemicals into landfills and waterways, suppressing the science showing these chemicals were toxic, poisoning the drinking water of millions of Americans. This strains credulity, credulity and that is putting it mildly. DuPont has in the past accepted liability for discharging PFAS chemicals into the environment, which led to serious problems, including birth defects, liver and thyroid and kidney disease, and cancer. Now a few years have passed, and there's been a spinoff, a merger, and then other spinoffs. So Mr. Roberts, I recognize that you're new with the company, but who is now responsible for this contamination, if not DuPont? Congresswoman, to, to go through your question. The DuPont Company has changed forms many times over the last 217 years. The last 10 years is not new and was not constructed in some way to avoid liability around the PFAS issue. The um, removal of the fibers business to Invista, the uh, spinoff of the Exalta business, which is related to our coatings, the performance chemicals business, which is related to the fluorochemicals uh, line of business, which is now called Comores, the creation of the merger with Dow and then the separation was about this company now reemerging as a company that's focused on sustainability. I mean, that's it, it fine. I understand restructuring. I've gone, I mean, I ran an organization. I know how restructures work, and that's yeah. fine. But, but who ultimately is responsible, if not DuPont? Who, who, Comores didn't exist when this was happening. I mean, they, they came into existence in 2015. So who takes accountability? Yeah. And if corporate law loopholes allow us to put our hands up like this, then the only people who are responsible are the American taxpayers, because the cleanup has to happen. This, to me, is a non-option. But who pays for it? And as far as I'm concerned, the company that was doing this in the first place should be held accountable. But if that company doesn't exist through corporate gymnastics, then who does pay that bill? Okay. Congresswoman, I, I fully agree with you. And in, in my opening statement, I stated, firstly, we're fully committed to remediating the sites that we own. I also heard, as we went through the opening statements, that Comores has very clearly stated that it's committed to doing remediation on the site that it now owns. Well, let's, let's so, talk so, about that. So really. I, I don't believe that either company is saying that there's not full commitment to making sure the sites that have been owned and operated, either currently by the company that's, that's called DuPont, or the division of DuPont, which was Performance Chemicals, which is still operating, which is financially viable in every well, way, shape, and form. I don't, I, don't mean to, I don't mean to cut you off, but I only have a minute left. Um, according to the Comores complaint against DuPont filed this year, there's issues with the estimates of cost cleanups uh, near Cape Fear, North Carolina, one of DuPont's legacy sites. The estimate was that it would be approximately $2 million in cleanup. Uh, Comores later learned that the actual cost of the cleanup would be somewhere around $200 million, and that's a huge difference in terms of estimates. Um, and then I'll jump really quickly. I guess what it boils down to is that if Comores doesn't have the money to pay the victims for all their injuries and to clean up all the contamination, then what happens? Is, is it DuPont's argument that taxpayers should pay and not DuPont, who's, who's responsible? Con Congresswoman, we don't believe the taxpayers should pay. What I would say when, when we hear the statement that Comores then later found out is that the individuals that were running the sites, the individuals that were developing the products, the individuals that ran this business related to the sites that were fully aware of the financials of the business, 
fully aware of the liabilities and profits and understood what it was taking with it are the same individuals that sit and run Comoros today. But, there's, so, but so, the $2 million estimate versus the $200 million estimate, that doesn't quite track. And I, I'm out of time, but I would maybe you can respond to that in writing after the fact. We would be glad to. Yielding back. Thank you. Thank you. The chair now recognizes Representative Comer for five minutes of questioning. Thank you, uh, Dr. Rutherford. I think it would be good for everyone to uh, know how 3M got into the PFAS business to begin with. I know in your testimony you mentioned relationships with the Navy and with firefighting foam, but can you briefly tell us how that relationship began? Yes, uh, Congressman, thank you for the question. We were involved in the development very early on of fluorochemical surfactants, and that was research that, that we had engaged in early days. We also had a patent that was purchased from a university that gave us technology in that area as well. And then after the um, aircraft carrier fire in, in, of the Forestal, where uh, our military uh, personnel lost many, many lives, many of their lives were lost, um, the Navy put out a request for um, a, a, an improved firefighting system for ships. 3M was one of the companies engaged in that research. It resulted in the Navy winning a patent for, uh, the fir and writing the first specifications for uh, the firefighting foams. And By not only getting out of long chain, Related firefighting phones across. And, and I've stated this in a previous hearing that we had on this subject, but the uh, Kentucky Firefighters Union came to my office and were very concerned about that. Uh, they obviously are concerned about their safety, as, as I'm sure every member of Congress is, and that was uh, an important component. So uh, that's, that's good to hear. They were concerned about their safety because Correct. the PFAS helps put out fires quicker than. Correct. Than just normal water. But, but I, right. I agree the normal water, but I right. think what we've seen now is a new generation of foams, which though I'm sure will have their own issue, are not biopersistent. Mm -hmm. So they are made up of alcohols or proteins, uh, which don't have that issue. Right. And we now have a generation which we think are just as effective as PFAS-related materials. So we are working with those companies. And Good. as we are focused on sustainability, we think we can de develop a roadmap that other companies can then follow once we've worked with these companies to develop this line of chemistry will remove the, this issue that we've heard across the country is really firefighting foams, so we're focused on addressing that issue. Good. Uh, Mr. Kirsch, I'm curious, are the people running Comoros business today the same people who ran it when it was a part of DuPont? No, they're not, Congressman. Uh, I think that was a, a slight misrepresentation. So on my staff, I run the floral products business, as I mentioned in my opening statement. Uh, my staff consists of 12 folks, uh, three of which have any, uh, anything to do with the previous DuPont fluoropolymers business. The rest are either new to the company or had no previous experience in, in fluoropolymers. Uh, to, my, uh, to the best of my understanding, uh, the way that the SPIN document was created, the current Comores leadership, anyone that was there at, at DuPont at the time, was not involved in the creation of that document. So to suggest that there was information uh, and the ability to, to uh, dictate those terms, I think is, is just false. Uh, hence, hence the, hence the uh, complaint. If, if, if I may. Yes. Uh, the gentleman who was the executive vice president of the floral chemicals business and had been so since 2008 is now the CEO mm -hmm. of Comores. So I just want to be clear here so that we can truly accept the areas where we're going to focus, that we can focus on remediating the sites that we own and that Comoros does the same. But I don't want to really sit here and, and, and go back and forth because it doesn't make sense, but I don't want to be in a shell game. When the head of the business is now the CEO, it's clear that there's, there's ownership and an individual who was a part of those discussions, who, who the scientists work for, and is currently running Comores, it makes it very difficult to say we don't, we don't know anything about it before 2015. I, 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 sorry, I need to comment on this. I, yes, Mr. Vignano is the CEO of Comores. Mr. Mr. Vignano was part of the DuPont company. Uh, I find it interesting that any request I've ever made to address sustainability issues or issues of remediation, which we are taking significant action, and we made significant commitments, ambitious commitments, one year ago, Mr. Vignano has approved every single one of those. I'm, I'm having trouble bridging this. Thank you. Yield back. Chair now recognizes Representative Sarbanes for five minutes of questioning. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thanks for convening this, this hearing on an important topic. So that last exchange was uh, pretty um, enlightening, I think. The fact that you have two uh, major corporations now pointing fingers at each other, and that's, a, that's exactly what was just happening, it shows a couple things. There's something wrong with these chemicals. That's an acknowledgement implicitly in that finger pointing that we just saw. And secondly, both companies know that there's a significant amount of legal liability and accompanying financial liability associated with these chemicals and how they were handled, and everybody's trying to get in front of that, I can see. Um, I want to come back uh, for a moment, um, Ms. Rutherford, to your testimony previously about the Responsible Science Policy Coalition, which I understand 3M is a member of or has helped to fund. And they have concluded among various studies they've done, quote, the weight of scientific evidence does not show that PFOA or PFOS cause health effects in humans. And you were asked about that, whether you agree with that or you don't agree with that. And I think you said you do agree with it. Congressman, that's correct. I how, do agree with that statement. Talk to me about that. How, how can you agree with this statement after all of the testimony that's come forward in the litigation and otherwise, that there are no health effects in humans from PFOA or PFOS. I just want to get into your head for a second, because on its face, it seems to me that that goes against the weight of the evidence, testimony, documents that have been presented for years uh, when it comes to the impact of those chemicals. Uh, Congressman, if I may. Yeah, go ahead. The Again, it, it is the, the complete understanding of, of how the testing is done, the analytics, the, uh, the approach to understanding this. I, I, I do appreciate that links and associations are, are indicated in those scientific studies. However, every study I've read, and I've read many, many of these studies, calls for additional work because there are a lot of inconsistencies in the data. Establishing a hu human health impact um, is, is a very complex thing. And we you, know, you know that back in, I guess, 1981, there was a memorandum inside 3M saying that as a precautionary measure, approximately 25 women of childbearing potential have received job reassignments at the 3M Decatur plant, so they will not be exposed to a type of fluorochemical that can cause birth defects in rats. So I guess, are you saying, well, it causes birth defects in rats, but that's not conclusive as to human effects. Nevertheless, there was a reassignment of 25 childbearing women. Are you aware of that testimony and document? Congressman, I am indeed aware yeah. of that testimony and that study. What, I, what I'd like to share with you is I felt that that was a, a measure of very strong responsibility on our part. There was a study conducted in which we observed some of these um, birth defects. Uh, in what we found also, though, is that this was an uh, inaccurate study. The way the fetus was dissected uh, was not repeatable. We shared these information with the EPA. And the way we discovered that, uh, Congressman, is that it showed up in the control group. The same issue that was found in the exposed population of the animals showed up in the control group with no exposure. So we were, we were that showed and uh, so something else. So on the one hand, I mean, I, I, get, I get your point here. You're trying to put a context around that particular uh, information, and that's fair to a point. But there's a lot of other information and evidence that has come forward, which really belies the statement and the conclusion that was reached by this Responsible Science Policy Coalition, which as far as I can tell is, is just a whitewash operation. I mean, it's, it's sort of, you know, everybody's going to be okay coalition, but I don't think that there's good science behind that from what we've, from what we've seen. The fact of the matter is the chemical industry has a tremendous amount of power, influence, resources, and they have deployed that for decades against the interests of the average person out there. They've done it with 
uh, lobbyists. They've done it with campaign contributions. They've done it by buying studies that then masquerade as science. And this continues to go on. We have a responsibility here to push back against that. And we're not going to we're not going to give up until we've done that. I appreciate your coming here today, but this is the beginning of a continuing inquiry into the harmful effects of these chemicals. And with that, I yield back. Thank you. The chair now recognizes Representative Wasserman Schultz for five minutes of questioning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Last year, the Union of Concerned Scientists released a report detailing PFAS contamination at 131 military facilities across the United States. At 90 percent of these sites, PFAS con concentration was 10 times higher than CDC's Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry, ASTDR, risk levels, which itself is much lower than the EPA's current health advisory. Two-thirds of these sites were at least 100 times the ASTDR risk level. I'd like the panel to consider this. At Patrick Air Force Base in Brevard County, Florida, PFAS contamination was found to be 4,338,000 parts per trillion. That's the level that was detected. That is 390,909 times the risk level. Many service members have developed cases of Hodgkin's lymphoma and other cancers. These chemicals were used at about 400 U.S. military installations, as we've discussed here today. Ms. Rutherford, what are 3M's plans for compensating service members and veterans that were exposed to these chemicals, chemicals that your company had determined as harmful to human health? Uh, thank you for the question, Congresswoman. As, as we transformed our own product portfolio and phased out of the chemicals that are part of AFFF, we discontinued that product. We have, nevertheless, continued to work with the Department of Defense to understand the safe use of these materials and the remediation. The remediation needs uh, around these, air, these bases do need to be addressed. Remediation is not what I'm asking you about. What I'm asking you about is what plans do you have to compensate service members and veterans that were exposed to these chemicals that you were aware were harmful to human health? Again, Congresswoman, we, the studies we have do not indicate uh, at the levels of exposure in the environment in the past or today that adverse human health effects exist. We are, however, continuing our studies, and we will work proactively with scientific bodies. Uh, met, it's, not, it's not only me, uh, Congresswoman. It is every, a lot of other government agencies, our own ATSDR, uh, Australia, Canada, Germany, uh, the weight of scientific evidence is, is there. We do agree additional study is required. I'm sorry. Uh, that, that's just not, that doesn't conform with what information I know that we've been given about 3M's awareness of the harmful effects of these chemicals. You began working with the Navy on developing your firefighting form in the 60s. At what point did you convey the research that you had done and the knowledge of the part product's harmful effects to DOD. Um, my understanding is that you do and were and withheld information about its harmful effects, and I want to know if you ever advised DOD that it should stop the use of the foam based on their, that awareness. Uh, as Congresswoman, as we became aware of the potential of bioaccumulation of some of the materials of these foams, that communication did indeed happen. So we've been uh, proactive in sharing that information, the risk of bioaccumulation. Bio and that's why we phased out of those two particular materials at the time, more than 20 okay. years ago. Okay. These chemicals have been significantly contaminating our servicemen and servicewomen, yet DuPont worried in its 2009 SEC annual filings that approximately, and this is a quote, $1 billion of 2009 revenues could be affected by any such regulation or prohibition of PFOA. While the company stated in the same report, DuPont believes that PFOA exposure does not pose a health risk to the general public. Did DuPont care more about its bottom line than about our men and women serving in the armed forces? And why have your companies, all of your companies, been fighting against additional regulation of PFAS chemicals, even though our service members who have come into contact with firefighting foam, foam or tainted groundwater are suffering from illness? Congresswoman, first of all, as I stated in my opening, we're not here uh, standing in in the way of regulation. We support very clearly uh, the line items that are included as part of the NDAA. So we're here to be cooperative. We're here to support, I think, the things that this Congress is talking about and understanding what type of legislation would really help to drive this 
uh, the situation in the right direction. So, so to start there, clearly uh, uh, requiring the EPA to set a national primary drinking water regulation for PFAS under the Safe Drink Drinking Water Act within two years is something that, that we're here to support, as well as other line items is under I, the EPA. I'm glad that you have taken this position now. But that was clearly not your position previously. Previously, your company did oppose regulation of these chemicals and maintained that you would lose a billion dollars of revenue in 2009 if there was any such regulation and kept the information about its harmful effects from the public. Isn't that correct? Uh, I don't know that to be the case, uh, Congressman. What well, I'm reading to you from words that were put out by your own company in a report. Okay. Uh, what I can tell you is what we believe today. What I can tell you is that we're here to support in a proactive way legislation that we think will drive this situation in, in the right direction. Does DuPont have plans to compensate people who have service members who have been harmed by exposure to these chemicals? Congresswoman, the DuPont company that I represent, and I believe what I also read in the Comora statement, was that AFFF or foams related uh, to this issue were not materials that were made by DuPont. They're, they're not now, and I don't believe that was the case in the past at all, but I would refer that to the gentleman from Comoros to, 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 uh, to respond to as well. Mr. Chairman, I know my time's expired, but if the, if, uh, the gentleman from Comoros could respond, that would be helpful. Yes, thank you, Congress, uh, Congresswoman. We, uh, Comoros has never uh, manufactured, sold, or formulated firefighting foams. Uh, I believe the issue, a question, is specifically around PFOS and PFOA. Neither one of those Comoros has ever used. Um, so, at this point, I'm not sure what else I could possibly add to the conversation. Are any of your companies that were responsible for using any of these chemicals that firefighters and military service members were exposed to planning any type of compensation to harmed victims? That's a question for all three of you. At this point, the DuPont company is focused on cleaning up and remediating the sites which we operate. That's our focus, as well as reducing the amount of, of firefighting foam that we use in our sites. Uh, but that's the, that's the limit of where we're focused at this time. So no. We are focused on, on what we... No. What's in, yes within or no. Our control. Yes or no. We'll continue to focus on what's within our control. That's not a yes or no answer. Yes or no. Are you I, planning at any point at compensating people who have been harmed by your com company's chemicals. Congresswoman, you're speaking specifically to I'm speaking armed specifically forces around to, the world? To, any, to, to this issue specifically. Yes. We are focused on working through Okay, the other the two people, if side. you could answer, please. Yes. The answer is no. <clears throat> Let's let, let the record reflect that the gentleman essentially said no, there are no plans. No, again, we have not been involved in um, PFOA or PFOS, which I think are the... So your answer is also no. Um, correct. Congresswoman, we have been actively engaged in our communities over many, many years conducting remediation yes or no. and studies. Yes Are there any plans that 3M has to compensate victims who have been damaged by your chemicals? I will reiterate my statement, Congresswoman, that our, our evidence does not indicate that anyone was that adverse human health effects were caused by these foams. That's Nevertheless, not, we're actually engaged with the DOD. That's not actually accurate in terms of the documents and the information that has been provided to the committee and to the military. Thank you. I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. The chair now recognizes myself for a line of questioning. Let me start with uh, Mr. Roberts. I thought your, your, your comment that the spin out of Comores had nothing to do with reducing the liability of DuPont was uh, uh, patently false. We know that boards and executive management teams uh, often spend time trying to figure out how to reduce liabilities, and I'm quite certain that DuPont, with its in-house attorneys and experts, figured out the best way to reduce the liability here was to spend it out to Comores. And that leads me to you, Mr. Kirsch. Uh, how much money was given to uh, Comores when it was started and spun out to address these liabilities? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I don't have the exact figure in my head in terms of what the accrual would be. I mentioned the uh, I mentioned the North Carolina case, the two million uh, max. I, I, I'm talking when you were spun out. Were you given a basket of assets to address the studies that DuPont had done to ascertain the potential liability they were going to have? 
Were you given money to address it? Uh, I'm not sure exactly how much money might have been accrued, uh, accrued, but there were maximum liabilities that were estimated, and I believe an accrual was set forth for that. And, of course, the maximum liabilities have shown to be extensively beyond that. I think you said in the one plant it's uh, 100 times greater than what was anticipated. That's correct. And, uh, Ms. Rutherford, I'm, I'm, I'm deeply confused. Uh, you said, I, I want to make sure I understand this, no one has been harmed by any PFAS chemicals that you are aware of? Congressman, what I did say... That's a yes or no. Come on, I don't need a long speech. Yes or no? We have no definitive cause and effect relationship. Or Great, so your point is no one in America right now, no one has been a victim of any PFAS chemicals, all 5,000, including PFOA and PFOS. That is your position. We state that the, the majority of the evidence does not indicate that, that to be true, sir. Then why the hell do you care there's been a 70 percent reduction in PFAS levels if it doesn't affect anyone? Because we know these are concerns of our colleagues, the people in our communities, and all of us. We all want to have confidence in our drinking water. Damn right. Because you guys have internal action. memos that show that it impacts people, uh, impacts your workers. You made changes in how you had those workers conduct their activities. You have internal memos showing how devastating this, these chemicals can be to certain individuals that become exposed to it. Yet you also stated earlier that you deny knowing about those internal memos? Uh, no, I don't believe so. I thought Ocasio-Cortez, Representative Ocasio-Cortez, asked you what knowledge you had of cover-up of information by 3M, and you stated, I believe, to the effect that you've been completely transparent and you're not aware of those situations. Is that incorrect? You are aware of the memos? I believe the conversation, uh, Chairman, well, Let me was, ask you a question. Are you aware of memos no, I'm, I'm and internal to... documentation at 3M showing clearly concerns about the hazardous aspects of exposure to these chemicals, both by workers of 3M as well as the general public. Are you aware of any documentation within 3M to that effect? There are studies, uh, Chairman, that indicate there are effects at extremely high doses as a result of our own scientific inquiry. That is a part of the, the evidence that, that we have at extremely high doses. In, in, in respect to how we commercialize our new products to ensure the safety of How do you define high doses? What would that be? Parts per trillion of what? Oh, no, this would be in uh, parts per hundred. So this is a very, very different order of magnitude. Many, many thousands of times higher than what you would be exposed to in the environment. I see. So what we've seen when witnesses previously coming in here who have been exposed to those levels, who have significant health hazards, uh, health outcomes, you would suggest it has nothing to do with the class of PFAS chemicals. It has something to do with some other item. Uh, Mr. Roberts, uh, I want to ask you, uh, you stated earlier that you would support uh, PFOS and PFOA being covered by the Superfund. Uh, is that correct? That's correct. Correct. Uh, Mr. Kirsch, would you as well? Uh, <clears throat> sorry, Mr. Chairman, I'm, I'm not the expert on uh, on the two compounds or or the, the legislation or the and the process. Uh, it sounds like the the EPA has enough information to make a decision. So your answer is no at this time. Uh, I'm, I think the EPA has enough information to make the decision, and I think that that's the decision they should make. And I think if they don't, I'm um, assuming okay. that you'll go okay. forward. Ms. Rutherford. Yes, Chairman. We believe the EPA should be allowed to use its process to make that decision. Mr. Roberts, if I understand things correctly, there's 5,000 chemicals under uh, the, the heading of PFAS. Uh, the long chain seem to be the ones that most people would agree are uh, uh, bad for our health. Uh, besides PFOS and PFOA, of the other 5,000 chemicals under the class of PFAS, how many of them are long chain, roughly? In other words, it's not just those two, no, correct? No, it's not just those two. If, if we think about the, the, uh, the chemicals which were identified under TRI, mm -hmm. uh, it was P, PFOA, PFOS, and about 22 other companies that were considered in that group okay. uh, that we talked about uh, reporting under TRI. That's the group that I think that we're talking about. That's why it's Thank part you. Of so the you EPA. answered my next question. So based on what we know with long chain, all long chain uh, compounds should fall under the Superfund, correct? Th that, that group would, would be acceptable. It's still a very small subgroup. Uh, they're all uh, have that, that the issue of being biopersistent. So if it was just those two or slightly larger group, 
you know, I think that's something that, that could be determined uh, by Congress. I've submitted legislation to support a trust fund to finance an EPA-administrated fee on PFAS manufacturers designed to raise at least $2 billion per year, uh, sufficient to cover 25 percent of what we know uh, we need in operation and maintenance costs associated with PFAS and, and predominantly PFOA and PFOS. Uh, would any of you three support legislation along those lines to hold manufacturers responsible for helping create a trust fund to address these uh, these cleanups. Congressman, for today we focused on the uh, sections that were under the NDA only because we knew that was uh, a current issue uh, on the Hill, uh, but we'd be more than happy to follow up with your office to understand more and have a discussion on that. We'd be more than happy to have that discussion. Mr. Kirsch. Uh, Mr. Chairman, we're spending tremendous amounts of uh, money to virtually eliminate the emissions of PFAS from all of our facilities, uh, tremendous amounts of money. Uh, I guess I would uh, also be inclined to work together with your office to understand better what this mechanism looked like. I also note that your lobbying efforts have also increased by 123 percent. I assume that's in an effort to address this issue in a way that is most satisfactory to Camores. Uh, I honestly don't know what the the, the lobbying uh, budget is for the for the company. Ms. Rutherford. Yes, Chairman. We're we're very interested in being involved in in additional testing and remediation uh, discussions, and we'd be glad to work with your office to understand exactly uh, that intent. Well, I'd like to thank all of you for coming in today. I know uh, there's been some tough questions, and uh, I. I I'm a little frustrated because I do feel like there's a little bit of round robin here and, and, and an unwillingness to uh, fully embrace the obligations that companies have to the trust of the American public when it comes to addressing uh, matters of our health and our, and our safety. Uh, uh, yet I also see some uh, potential light uh, and, and I appreciate, Mr. Roberts, your commitment on behalf of DuPont to see some of these uh, chemicals under PFAS be brought into the Superfund uh, oversight. And at this time, the Chair would like to recognize uh, Representative Wasserman Schultz for additional questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it. Um, referring back to PFAS being one of the biggest sources of contamination in the Department of Defense's use of PFAS containing firefighting foam. Um, the department has resisted cleaning up the contamination that it caused and argues that PFAS has not yet been designated a hazardous substance under the Superfund law. Making the Superfund designation would also free up EPA funding and other resources to help clean up civilian sites, critical to us addressing this, the remediation that you're referring to. Even former EPA administrator Scott Pruitt said a year and a half ago that EPA would designate some PFAS chemicals to be hazardous substances under the Superfund law. But I know I don't have the confidence that EPA is going to propose a rule that takes that step, let alone finalize one. So to the panel, and I would like a straight yes or no answer, do you agree that legacy PFAS chemicals like PFOA and PFOS should be designated as hazardous substances under the Superfund law? Ms. Rutherford? Congresswoman, we, are, we do not uh, believe that is the case, the EPA should make so the no. definition. No. At this time, based on the science, we, we're, not, we're not policy makers, ma'am. We, we, we cannot make that assessment for the United States. No. It's up to the EPA. Yes or no? No. no. Okay. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> I'm not the expert. Um, I realize you're not the expert. Yes or no, do you believe that PFAS chemicals like PFOA and PFOS should be designated as hazardous substances under the Superfund law. I, I think the EPA has all the information they need based on what I've heard. I'm not asking what, whether that, that question. I'm asking you if your company's position I, is that it should be designated as a hazardous substance under the I, Superfund I, law. Uh, Congresswoman, I, uh, I appreciate the, the line of questioning, but with all due respect, that's, that's as much as I can answer. So you won't answer the question? I, I, I think You're that refusing the, the, to answer what your company's position I, I think is the, the EPA, on whether or not. The, sorry, the EPA has uh, all the information they need. You're refusing to answer the question. You will not answer yes or no on whether or not your company believes that these chemicals should be designated as hazardous substances under the Superfund law. You're refusing to answer the question. Is that correct? The, the answer would be no. You don't think so. Uh, I don't. think 
the, the again, the EPA has all the information. don't think that that designation should be made. The, the EPA has all the information that they need. And so to, your answer is no. Is that what you're saying? No. I said the EPA has all the information they need. So you're, to make are that you refusing decision. to answer, or are you saying no? I, I think I did answer the question. No, you didn't. Yes or no to my question. The, again, the EPA has all That's the information. That's not yes or no. So essentially, you're refusing to answer. Mr. Roberts? Congresswoman, for PFOA and PFOS, our answer is yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, during the subcommittee's July hearing on PFAS and industrial contamination, Emily Donovan, who lives in a community plagued by water laced with several PFAS chemicals, called on all PFAS chemicals to be designated as hazardous under the Superfund law. And I agree with Ms. Donovan. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to enter into the record a letter that was signed by 162 House members asking the NDAA conference to regulate all PFAS chemicals. And to the panel, if you want this subcommittee, this Congress, and the American public to believe that you are ready to take your obligation to clean up these chemicals seriously, this is your moment. Do any of you agree, hopefully all of you agree, that all PFAS should be designated as hazardous under the Superfund law? So far, I've gotten a no and, an, and a refusal to answer and a yes. So, Congressman, yeah. my, my yes was for PFOA mm -hmm. and PFOS, the, the bile persistent long chains. I do not agree that that's the right statement for the entire class of 6,000 chemicals. Okay. So uh, my, my answer was very specific to PFOA and PFOA. To those two chemicals. Correct. Thank you. Um, to those of you that have disagreed or refused to answer, uh, you are playing a part in this national emergency. You have sickened our first responders and our members of our military, and I don't know how you sleep at night. Thank you. I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. Without objection, all members will have five legislative days within which to submit additional written questions for the witnesses to the chair, which will be forwarded to the witnesses for the response. I ask our witnesses to please respond as promptly as you are able. This hearing is adjourned. Thank you. Hi, how are you? Sweet game with who?